Good on you, our view. Uh, welcome to our 2022 symposium, the government's speech and the constitution. We're glad to have you here. So uh, let's get started. Uh, so uh, first, I would like to invite uh, Dean Vikram Amar, our uh, Dean of our College of Law, to uh, give us a welcome speech. Thank you, Young Lee. Uh, welcome, everybody. First, uh, on behalf of the college and the university, I want to thank all of you uh, for joining us today. We have a, a remarkable set of speakers and, uh, and thinkers, uh, many of whom are my friends, and I, I'm, I'm enjoying seeing all of you uh, out here. Uh, and, uh, and today is going to be a very interesting and productive event. As for today's topic, uh, government speech, um, please allow me to offer uh, two brief thoughts. First, on the question of what is government speech, I, for one, uh, am not sure. Uh, I certainly uh, don't know it when I see it if I go by the uh, Supreme Court uh, cases. For example, six years ago, the court decided a major government speech case, Walker versus Sons of uh, Confederate Flags. A group wanted to depict the Confederate flag in the background on a special license plate in Texas, and state authorities said no. It might have been the right result, but was the court correct to say that specialty plates are government speech and that's why Texas can exclude this message from its own? That sounds very far-fetched to me. Does Texas really believe that Remax is the max? <laughs> uh, or would Texas really rather be golfing? Uh, or does the state exhort the Crimson Tide and the Fighting Irish to football success, presumably over the Longhorns? The state motto on standard issue plates is one thing, as, uh, as we saw in Woolley versus Maynard, but do these specialty plates and their messages really belong to Texas? As I said, I think the case may very well have been right, but only because the Confederate flag used to be government speech. It was Texas's speech during the Civil War, and perhaps Texas has a distinct interest in disassociating itself from that message, but in that case, then the, 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 the ruling, the, the, the litigation, it really isn't about license plates, it's about Confederate flags. And I think that framing would have been a more helpful one as far as government speech doctrine goes. About a month after that case came down, I became the Dean here at this esteemed public university and public law school. So now I am the government. And because of that, when I wear my decanal hat, I spend a lot of time focusing not just on the what of government speech, but the when and the how. It seems like every day people wanna know what the College of Law's position on this or that controversy in America and the world is. Um, you know, take the, take the, the, the tragedy uh, in Indianapolis last night. The College of Law doesn't have a position on the shooting of eight people um, uh, at that FedEx facility, other than that it's a tragedy, but I can't comment on every tragedy that I read about in the news every day. Uh, some people will uh, interpret that event uh, in terms of gun control, others in terms of mental health. The College of Law, however, uh, doesn't have a distinctive take, and I for one think that uh, many universities and law schools might do well to have fewer positions um, at least on topics that don't distinctively affect academic operations uh, for many reasons. Uh, let me give you just a few. First of all, when I think about speaking on behalf of the law school, I have to worry about vertical consistency. What has my chancellor said? What has the president of my university said? I can't be out in front of them. I can't be contradicting them. Uh, when I speak for the law school, am I speaking for my entire faculty or a majority thereof? Do I have time for a faculty meeting on every topic on which I might want to speak? And if not, am I misrepresenting what the College of Law really believes? Uh, and then there's horizontal consistency. If I speak up condemning this particular outside speaker or student group uh, event, uh, uh, what about other groups that feel victimized by something some other outside speaker or, or student group uh, does or says? Uh, more important, perhaps, than all that, uh, and this highlights how each government entity, I think, must approach the how much to speak question uh, a little differently. I don't want to speak so often that people stop listening to me or so loudly that other people in the law school are freed from doing their own thinking and speaking. 
After all, what we're here to do is to foster their ability to speak and think uh, and discuss with each other. And I don't wanna crowd any of that out. Now, again, that may be a distinctive purpose of a law school, um, uh, but I think a lot of other government institutions would be well to consider uh, those factors as well. Uh, with that, I will shut up uh, and I, I'll close by adding that the, the few remarks I just offered were, uh, were on behalf of myself only and not on, on behalf of the College of Law. So uh, with that, let me welcome you again and, and thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Dina Marr. So I just wanna reiterate that, uh, welcome everybody. My name is Kat and I'm the outgoing editor in chief of the Law Review. Um, we've worked with Professor Norton for the past eight months to develop this event. And we are thrilled to have you here today with us to hear from our 13 contributors. And before we begin, I do wanna recognize Yang Lee who has put in countless hours to make this event possible. So, you know, thank you, Will Yang Lee, big thanks. Couldn't do it without you. Um, and with that, I am pleased to introduce Professor Helen Norton of the University of Colorado Law School and author of The Government Speech and the Constitution. Good morning, everyone. I want to start with heartfelt thanks to the University of Illinois College of Law and to the Illinois Law Review for making this event possible. And in particular, I want to recognize Editor-in-Chief Kat Walton and Symposium Editor Yang Li Yang, from whom you just heard. They've been amazingly professional, conscientious, thoughtful, and gracious in every respect from day one, and it's been a, a very great privilege to work with them. I'm grateful to have this opportunity to talk with you today and for the chance to learn from today's exceptional lineup of contributors. This is a special treat for me as each of them is a scholar whose work I've deeply admired for years. Our hope is that this symposium's discussion will influence the conversation for years to come about the important yet underexplored implications of the government speech. I'm gonna take just a few minutes to explain why I think the government's speech is interesting and important and to explain how I think about the constitutional issues triggered by the government speech. The government is unique among speakers because of its coercive power as sovereign, because of its considerable resources, because of its privileged access to key information, and because of its wide variety of speaking roles as policymaker, commander in chief, employer, educator, healthcare provider, property owner, and more. The government speech has unusual capacity for both value and harm precisely because of its governmental source. And the government speaks in an astonishingly wide range of ways. As we'll shortly hear, for example, Danielle Keats-Citron and Kate Shaw are among those interested in exploring how and why the government speaks. Professor Citron, for example, explores how lawmakers talk about the collection and the use and the sharing of personal data and why that matters. And P Professor Shaw will examine the mechanisms through which presidents speak to the public. When we discuss constitutional law, we usually focus on the constitutional rules that apply to what the government does. Far less clear are the constitutional rules that apply to what the government says. Governments must speak, speak in order to govern and so governments have been speaking for as long as there have been governments. Even so, only in the last few decades has the Supreme Court recognized government speech as an exercise of governmental power with constitutional implications of its own. The government needs the power to control its own speech in order to govern. And regardless of whether you love or hate the government's views, its expression generates important conversations and helps inform our political choices. The Supreme Court's government speech doctrine now recognizes this reality by permitting the government a defense, a shield from free speech clause challenges brought by those who seek to shut down or change what is the government's own message. In other words, the government does not engage in viewpoint-based discrimination in violation of the free speech clause when it simply expresses its own view. But to be sure, we should remain wary of government actors that misunderstand the government's speech defense as a sword with which the government can pierce others' free speech rights. So what I call first stage government speech problems require us to figure out when the government is itself speaking and when it is instead regulating what is really our speech. And this is important because the constitutional rules that apply to the government when it speaks itself are very different from those that apply to the government when it regulates others' speech. 
Now, as the government's expressive capacities grow, so too does the government's potential for undermining others' rights and for distorting public discourse. So if and when we determine that the government itself is speaking, we then turn to what I call second stage problems, which consider whether and when the government's speech violates specific constitutional rights. These problems focus on whether and when specific constitutional provisions can be understood to restrain the government's speech. And as examples today, we'll hear Cliff Roski considered whether and when the government's deliberate silences might violate the Equal Protection Clause. And we'll hear Alex Sessis explore when and how the government's religious speech violates the Establishment Clause. In other words, some constitutional limits still apply to the government as a speaker, even though those limits differ from those that constrain the government as a regulator. I'm interested in these problems for a variety of reasons, including the fact that to date, the Supreme Court has failed in any sustained or coherent way to grapple with when and how the government speech itself sometimes affirmatively threatens specific constitutional protections. So in other words, in my opinion, the Supreme Court's government speech doctrine is incomplete. So I've proposed a framework for thinking about these problems. And more specifically, I suggest that we ask and answer a series of questions about the consequences of and the motivations underlying the government speech. Some of these questions focus on different types of harmful effects or injuries that the government speech may inflict on its targets. And some of these questions focus instead on the various purposes for the government speech. I'll give a little more detail. First, focusing on certain harmful effects. When does the government speech change its targets choices or their opportunities to their disadvantage? And does the constitution bar the government from causing those disadvantages? In other words, this question asks whether and when the government speech interferes with its listeners choices or opportunities in ways that would violate a constitutional right if the government caused those same changes through its traditional lawmaking, in other words, through its hard law. I'm thinking, for example, of the government's threats that silence dissenters as effectively as jailing them. I'm thinking of the government's religious speech that coerces listeners' participation in prayer or other religious observance as effectively as fining or taxing those who refuse to participate. And I'm thinking of the government's lies that pressure or deceive its targets into relinquishing their constitutional rights as effectively as denying those rights altogether. And as one illustration, later today, we'll hear Professor Torres Spellacy explore how the government's election-related lies can interfere with voting rights. Second, when we turn from the potentially harmful effects of the government speech to consider instead the government's reasons, its purposes for speaking, then we ask, what are the intentions underlying the government's expressive choices? And does the constitution bar the government from seeking to accomplish those purposes. In other words, sometimes the government speaks to accomplish objectives that many find morally wrongful, find constitutionally illegitimate. This may be the case, for example, of the government speech intended to advance some religions at the expense of others, or the government speech intended to interfere with voting or other constitutionally protected rights, or the government speech intended to harm certain individuals or communities. And along these lines, today we'll hear Bill Ariza consider the equal protection questions triggered by the government's speech motivated by its animus against members of marginalized groups based on their protected class status. And later, Michael Kang and Jacob Eisler will explore the First Amendment questions triggered by the government's speech motivated by partisan animus. I see these questions about the effects of and the motivations underlying the government speech as different ways to capture our intuitions about when and how the government speech is constitutionally dangerous. Each draws support from pockets of theory or doctrine or sometimes both, and each has its strengths and its weaknesses. To be sure, there's also great value in considering non-constitutional responses to the government speech that we find dangerous. And these responses include statutory, political, structural, and expressive strategies for influencing the government's expressive choices. For example, as we'll hear shortly, Claudia Haupt and Wendy Parmet 
are interested in tort law responses to the government's lies about COVID and other public health matters. I don't suggest that the framework I've proposed will make hard government speech problems easy. And I expect that good, kind, and reasonable people will disagree about how to answer these questions as applied to specific problems. But the exercise of asking and try to, trying to answer these questions about effects and about motivations, I think itself helps illustrate what makes hard government speech problems hard and what makes easier problems easy. And I think that's an important step towards thoughtful and principled problem solving. So now I'll turn things over to today's moderator, Illinois College of Law professor, Jason Mazzoni. I've long admired Professor Mazzoni's work and I'm deeply grateful for his generosity in sharing his time and insight with us today. Uh, so thank you, Helen, and uh, thank you, uh, especially Young Lee and Kat for putting together today's uh, event. I know a huge amount of work went into this, um, but special congratulations to you, Helen, on this wonderful book that gives us all so much to think about and talk about. Welcome to all of uh, you uh, here today to engage in that conversation. Um, my, uh, my, I'm here in a procedural capacity rather than a substantive capacity, so I'm going to keep you all sort of um, on time, strictly on time, uh, so that we'll have a chance to uh, talk and hear from uh, everybody who's here to present. Um, and so as you heard, uh, as you saw in the uh, email announcements that went around, um, you are given uh, 12 to 15 minutes for individual papers. And, since you're a law professor, I know you understood that to mean I have 15 minutes to talk. Um, and so uh, what I'm going to do is give you at 12 minutes um, um, a, um, a, a chime uh, that will indicate that that uh, is a 12 minute mark. And then um, at 15 minutes, you will hear a far more offensive sound, uh, at which point uh, you will stop talking. Uh, and so we'll hear the, the, the full set of papers, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions. If you have questions, just raise your uh, virtual hand and I will try to get uh, through as many of you as possible. Um, and my plan sort of over the course of the day is to try to make sure that uh, people who didn't get to speak in earlier sessions, ask questions in earlier sessions, get to ask them in later sessions. So um, with, with that, um, we start our first uh, panel and with Claudia Hupp and uh, Wendy uh, Parmet. Excellent, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jason. and, and um... Uh, Helen and, and the, uh, the law review editors. Um, so <clears throat> um, we want to talk about um, government speech in the context of, um, of COVID-19 uh, and specifically uh, misinformation kind of distorted signs. We put together a little, uh, little word cloud here with uh, some of the most egregious um, statements that, that we've seen from government officials. And so this is about the lies spread by um, President Trump and, and other government officials during the pandemic. And what we're trying to do is kind of analyze um, what the First Amendment can teach us um, and then also look at um, you know, the harmful effects that, that Helen actually just mentioned. Um, and, and from a listener perspective, sort of what, what the government's role is in giving advice that that um, directly implicates the way that um, individuals make their choices. And so um, I'll just give you a very quick um, outline of um, what we'll talk about in, of course, 15 minutes or less. Um, so um, uh, Wendy's going to kick off. Uh, we'll actually take turns to keep it uh, to keep it entertaining. Uh, Wendy's going to kick off and talk a little bit about the types of misinformation that we've seen and who the, you know what the messages were and who the speakers were. Um, we've tried to put together a little taxonomy of of speakers and messages and um, kind of talk a little bit about um, uh, what the what the distinctions are. And then I'll come back. Um, I'll talk about. Uh, what a First Amendment sort of normative perspective can teach us uh, about how we should think about these uh, these issues, and I'll I'll distinguish the government's message from um, sort of private speech and public discourse, and then of course professional speech, because a lot of this is about giving um, what otherwise would be expert advice, uh, but not within a professional client or a doctor patient relationship, but instead sort of. Um, in publicly disseminated government settings. And so um, I'll try to sort of distinguish uh, 
um, what that means. And then Wendy's going to come back and solve the problem um, through the lens of tort law. And we want to talk about the interaction between speech protection, um, tort liability, and what we could do in the context of public health to ensure that listeners actually get, um, get good advice and don't get harmed by uh, bad government advice. So I'll kick it over to Wendy. Thank you, Claudia, and thank you to all of the organizers. Uh, really thrilled to be able to participate in this. We're definitely a work in progress, um, but um, we're deep into thinking about this. And I think one of the things we have to start by thinking about is what we mean by misinformation, right? Um, we don't mean incomplete information or information um, that is later proven to be wrong as we learn more, right? So we're thinking here, we're focusing on health-related information. So obviously as a pandemic or any health situation arises, as the science develops, we learn more. And that's not what we're talking about. We're really trying to think about the kind of information that is contrary to the best scientific um, cons at consensus at the time that we would say in a sense, and we'll come back to this at the end, would be in a sense malpractice if it was said in the course of a private um, physician-patient relationship, for example. And then we think it's important to um, try to think about different speakers, right? And different kinds of information. So first of all, one category would be government speakers who are themselves trained in and often licensed in a health profession. You know, think Dr. Fauci. Conversely, think Dr. Scott Atlas, right? I mean, these are people who, when they speak, they're really wearing dual hats. They're government officials, but they're also, you know, public health officials, physicians, right? And so there is a potential in when they speak about issues and when they speak in ways that are not aligned with the best scientific consensus um, to really create, I think, confusion, right, for the listener. Are they speaking as a doctor? Are they speaking as a politician? Um, in contrast, we can think about health people with medical degrees, physicians, and others with expertise who are public officials, but who are working for the public in ways that have nothing to do with their expertise, right? So we'll give the example of a physician who's sitting on a zoning board who's talking about masking during COVID. Um, that's not related to their public duty. They are public officials. They might even be in the course of the zoning board meeting, but the government, but people are not looking to them. They don't have responsibility for public health in that moment. On the other hand, there may be some added expertise, credence given to your speech. Then there are, and this is, I think, an important and complicated category for us, right? Folks without any training in health, or, um, but actually have responsibility. So, you know, think about our current and past president. Um, they're issuing statements, or all of the governors, right, who have, you know, many of whom had daily uh, information sessions and press briefings on COVID. And they're giving health information. They're not only giving public policy information, they're giving health information. They may be speaking in alignment with the science, or they may be speaking in ways that contradict the science, you know, in just bleach, right? But they're speaking sort of in their official, we're here to protect the public's health capacity. And then of course there are lay officials who um, may not, who have government authority. They're not particularly focused on public health, but in fact, they also may have no expertise. And when we did this slide, we did school principles, but I think actually the principal case shows the complexity of the blurring of the lines of the categories because principals are not experts on COVID, but they certainly have responsibility in many ways. They are charged to protecting the health of the students and their staff. So again, I think that shows some of the blurring of the lines. And take it away, Claudia. All right. So what we decided to do with this is to, to kind of take a look at what, um, what the normative aspects of the First Amendment can tell us. So the underlying justifications for why we want to protect certain types of speech 
in this area really cut in, in, in different directions in these, in these contexts. And so on the one hand, um, as we actually just heard, um, uh, the government can choose its own message to the exclusion of all others, right? It can be anti-smoking um, and that's fine without offending um, First Amendment, the First Amendment as, it, as you know, this type of, of um, picking and choosing of messages otherwise would. Um, we also want government to be responsive to citizens, uh, democratic self-government uh, as, a, as a function of the First Amendment. Um, and we also want the government, uh, as, as Wendy just said, to make a, um, a wide range of policy decisions. And so that kind of leaves us with um, democratic accountability rather than First Amendment um, constraints really on, on what the government may say. So, so this is no public forum where each message has to be treated equally. Um, and there's no content or, or viewpoint neutrality that we would impose. Um, and so if it's bad government advice on COVID, then there's really, um, there's really very little that we think um, the First Amendment can do here, um, which is of course different from public discourse where we have this assumption of equality of, of speakers, um, where the government may not pick or choose uh, among speakers. And so content and viewpoint neutrality is required. So if you have somebody in public discourse who just gives bad advice, they may be, um, they may be a licensed professional even, right? They're not constrained by, um, by anything and you can have counter speech to make the other side of the argument. But of course that falls away um, in the government speech context. Um, this is also of course different from professional speech um, where we have legal guardrails such as licensing, discipline, um, uh, malpractice liability, fiduciary duties, informed consent um, that ensure that only good advice, um, by which uh, we mean advice that is aligned with, um, with professional expertise, is given to, um, well, in this case, is given to the patient. And so um, that's, I think, where um, you know, a focus on sort of the, the, the boundaries that, tr you know, where the First Amendment tracks those boundaries where, um, where expertise is communicated. Um, uh, there's of course no professional malpractice if that's done in the professional client relationship. Um, on the other hand, uh, we don't have that as a guardrail uh, when the government speaks. So on the other hand though, Going back to what the government is supposed to do, and this is a lot of this is a lot of sort of uh, distinguishing categories. Um, the normative underpinnings of government speech are not met when when government officials communicate messages that are not aligned with expertise. I mean, the goal should be right. The goal should be that um, that good public health advice, for example, is communicated by government officials during a pandemic. Um, but we're still left with no accountability outside of the democratic process. And so the question is, why isn't democratic accountability sufficient here? Um, uh, one answer could be that it is very much like a, a doctor patient uh, relationship in the sense that um, we have the same asymmetries of knowledge uh, between government speakers and the public um, that also exist in, in the professional speech context. Um, and that can impede accountability because of the because of these because of this this asymmetry. Um, another may be that that democratic accountability may not really um, work because of the listener's perception of what the government speaker says as an imperative to act. So, ingest bleach, for example, would be uh, taken as you know direct advice. And so, if that's the case, then democratic accountability is an insufficient mechanism to um, kind of police the boundaries of, of good advice. And so we're sort of left with, you know, in some, in some cases, this is very much like a professional speaker without the guardrails of professional speech. Um, and so what do we do about that in the absence of A, a system of uh, responsive democratic accountability and B, in the absence of a system of you know, the equivalent of, of malpractice liability um, for government speakers. And so Wendy will tell us what to do about that. Well, at least I'll raise some more questions that follow. Um, and following from what Claudia said, I mean, we do think that at least in some categories of the profe uh, 
official professional speech, as we call it, are there are some significant analogies to professional speech. And professional speech, as we know, um, at least you know, in malpractice, when it's contradicted by standards of care, um, is not subject to First Amendment, right? The court still allows us to bring in malpractice claims against physicians who tell us to do things that harm us when, the, when what they tell us is contradicted to expertise. So we wonder whether, in a sense, private law has a role to play in some of the categories that we are looking at. Um, and again, I think that there are, as Claudia has said, some significant analogies. There are also some differences. But where government is, again, pro government professionals, and particularly where there's the danger of blurring of the line, Right, where someone who is in, responsible for public health, and maybe even particularly when they have that professional license, and then gives information. Not when we're not, again, we're not talking about policy advice. We're talking about you know misinformation. Ingesting bleach is good for you. Masks hurt you. That kind of misinformation that people can then that affects how people immediately go about their own lives. We do think that private law might have a role to play here. Um, on the other hand, um, and I should say private law may have a role to play for the particular individuals who may be harmed, right? Where democratic accountability might not work. But we do need to note that there are, of course, some limitations, not the First Amendment, in the private law context. First, private law does not generally regulate right, ex professional speech outside of physician-patient relationships. So if you know a doctor writes an op-ed that says having bleach is good, that's a very different thing than doing it in the course of the patient-physician relationship. So is there a subcategory of this kind of profession, uh, excuse me, official speech that we can identify and crystallize as really close enough to professional speech. And also courts are reluctant, we think, right, to hold public health officials accountable actually in almost any circumstances. So there are immunity doctrines that are really powerful here. There um, professionals, advice might be thought to be discretionary actions, right? So it's going to be hard to find, and to be blunt, we have yet to find such a case, um, which I think tells us a little bit about the trouble. But we do think and that courts should recognize a tort against professionals and lay health officials who have public health authority, right, are acting in that public health way and are really calling upon individuals to do things to, in ways that are contradictory to expertise. And really in a sense then now to use the tort principle that is foreseeable that it will lead to harm to identifiable um, individuals, to in, at least to individuals. And again, you know, the ingest bleach masks are dangerous we think are the kinds of examples. As we work through this, um, you know, we need to recognize, and we obviously will, some of the problematic nature. We recognize that some of the categories we're talking about are, um, you know, difficult to delineate. The ingest bleach might be an example of one that's sort of so extreme. But um, this is very much a work in progress, but we hope to discuss the arguments for not assuming that the remediation of lethal lies, deadly misinformation by public health officials must always be left purely to the democratic process. We expect to conclude that that process is insufficient and that the analogies to professional speech and the First Amendment reasons for allowing government speakers to speak and not applying the First Amendment to professional speech are sufficiently compelling for tort law to begin to play a more robust role. I think we came in under the buzzer. Yeah, just under the buzzer. Um, thank you so much. And then come back to uh, Kate uh, for the third presentation. Will that work? Of course. No, I was just going to suggest it. Um, that's the beauty small beauty of being on Zoom in the moment in which we can see each other. But um, okay, so it's it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much.
Kat and Young Lee. And I particularly first wanted to say that I wished we were in person so that I could see Helen's face turn various shades of red in which um, after I say that she's one of the most humble and brilliant people I know. And so the very fact that we are having a conference in her honor is something that she would never brag to anyone about. In fact, many of her colleagues at Colorado don't know about this event and that's classic Helen. Um, but, but Helen, I am so delighted and honored to be part of this. I've been really lucky to be your co-author on two papers and um, as a colleague and I, I always learn from you. And so it is such a delight to talk about sort of what your work has given all of us and taught all of us um, and, and have a conversation about it. So I'm, it's wonderful to be here. Um, so I wanna, and, and Helen knows I would run up and hug her, but um, the, the uh, format is limiting my, my typical impulse. Um, but I, um, and, and through our work together, I think one of the wonderful things that, that, that Helen has taught us in her work is to ask that step first question, which is, is it the government speaking? Is the government being transparent? Do we know what they're saying, right? And then to of course wrestle at stage two with what the implications are. Um, and so what I wanna do is um, to talk about two things. Uh, both relate though to intimate privacy. And by that, I mean the, the ways in which we have access to and information about our bodies, our health, our sex and sexuality and gender, um, our um, some innermost thoughts and communications uh, and our close relationships. And there's two ways in which we've seen government speak. One in which um, I'm gonna start us off by saying, um, if we could figure out that it was the government, I think it clearly was. It's something we want to discourage and, and we and may indeed have stage two problems as Helen would call them. And the second and, and where my work is focusing is on where I want to see more government expression uh, and engagement uh, in thinking about intimate privacy as a civil right. But the first, and so Helen, as I'm writing my book now, I, I couldn't help but, but think about what would, I have the notion of what would Helen say and do <laughs> in my mind, but thinking about the way in which President Trump, um, when um, there was the early release of, so the Department of Justice releases 400 emails between Peter Strzok, uh, counterintelligence agents and Lisa Page, um, their private communications and texts to one another, largely about their personal relationship, having absolutely nothing to do with the presidency and really warranting no justification um, for the release of their tax, their private tax to the public. But the Department of Justice in the literally at night, <laughs> uh, spokesperson releases the text to reporters on it with a wink and a nod saying, I shouldn't be doing this. And then the next day releases to the public those texts and the president then on Twitter in countless tweets, more than 50, and then goes on Fox News and other media outlets um, to highlight those texts, those private communications, um, mostly all about personal matters, having absolutely nothing to do with government, no justification under the Privacy Act to release them without their consent and to go on. And so this is where Helen's underscoring the government's um, access to information that no other entity, of course, would have, um, and using its coercive power, um, describes you, President Trump describing Peter Strzok and Lisa Page as treasonous lovers. He simulates an orgasm, forgive me, sorry, folks, it's, this is my welcome to my world, right? Um, uh, an orgasm um, by the lovers at a rally um, and accuses them of being treasonous. He quotes their private texts, which have nothing to do with whether or not, you know, they had bias against the president. Um, and he goes on TV um, and other outlets talks about, invokes and specifically discusses their private texts. And here we have, I think a perfect illustration is it's definitely the imprimatur of the state, right? We have the president using his Twitter account. And I know we can think about all that wonderful night litigation for the blocking of, of individuals on Twitter. And here we have the government speaking, right? Um, uh, we have the president using his perch to, and I believe with the intent to silence, to demean, to humiliate, to destroy reputation, and certainly to undermine the equality of, of Lisa, certainly Lisa, um, you have the president speaking in a way that I think might certainly raise uh, concerns the stage to questions. 
Um, right at the time, we saw the government's exploitation of intimate privacy, so private communicative texts, um, in ways using its powerful access to that information, exploiting it, and clearly designed and intended to silence, and with the effect of silencing, reputation destroying, equality undermining speech of the government. So I, I suppose that's part of my world, which I want us to discourage, right? Um, uh, that sort of government speech. And the second, and uh, it has to do with government putting its toes a little bit uh, and expressing itself about privacy as a civil right. So just to set the scene, it's 2019, the New York AG, Letitia James, um, is announcing in a press release her investigation and settlement agreement with the gay dating app, Jack. Um, and the, the premise of her jurisdiction is unfair and deceptive acts and practices, right? So she's investigating the dating app um, for lying to consumers, lying to subscribers, um, breaking its promise that it was securing information, and then engaging in unfair security practices because the app had been told for a full year that it had security vulnerabilities on the back end of its portal and that people's nude photos were vulnerable to being hacked and leaked. Now, what AG James does is really important here, right? In the press release, instead of focusing on the broken promise and the unfair unfairness of the security vulnerability, she talks about sort of a shame on you, Jack, for refusing to fix a security failure when you know that 80% of your users are gay, bi, trans, men of color, who are all the very likely have an increased risk of hate crimes, of bullying, of harassment and discrimination as a result of the leaking of their nude photos. And she says quite clearly, Jack, you have screwed up because you have prioritized, I'm using her words, your profits over individuals and subscribers' privacy. And really what she's saying is, is intimate privacy as the gateway precondition to equality, which is very much the sort of anti-discrimination approach, right, of our modern civil rights laws. And I'd like AG, I'd like AG James, and I'd like governments to go further, right? Um, not only civil rights as anti-discrimination mandates, but more broadly, and I'm gonna use Robin West's wonderful work on civil rights, to suggest, and she's building on Martha Nussbaum and Amartya, Amartya Sen and Thomas Paine to argue that civil rights are natural and human rights that owed each and every one of us that help promote kind of our core capabilities and civic engagement. And that's precisely what intimate privacy does. We should understand privacy, that it's a substantive right, a civil right deserving of protection. Uh, and I'd like to see governments say that loudly proudly, not just in press releases, and clearly in legislation. So um, thank you so much for, for um, having us and having me today. And um, I want to say again, celebrating Helen is, is such a delight. It's so deserved. Uh, and it is such a joy to be here. So thank you. Oh, excellent. You didn't even trigger the chime. Uh, so um, thank you. Uh, and so uh, Kate Shaw is back. Uh, so uh, Kate, over to you. Thanks, Jason. And I'm so sorry about that. And Danielle, I hope that didn't take you aback when you had to jump in, but thank you. Um, and sorry, if terribly timed crash, but I'm back and delighted to be here. And thank you so much to the organizers and to Helen for the opportunity to participate um, in this symposium. Um, so I'm gonna focus both in the talk and in the paper that I'm working on on a dimension of government speech that isn't you know, the central concern of Professor Norton's book, but is I think closely linked to the central concerns. Um, and you know, that is the way that government speech reaches us. Um, so not how to identify or how to classify or how to treat government speech, but again, sort of the methods of conveyance and president's uh, interactions with the regulatory state um, around the conveyance of presidential speech. Um, and I should say, this is probably true for other contributors as well, but the book is incredibly generative and I really uh, thought about going in a bunch of different directions with my contribution. And so if what I'm saying today seems a little inchoate, it's because I've just kind of come to rest on this approach. Um, but I feel like there's like six different papers that I wanted to write when I first sat down to read the book. Um, okay, so um, so I'm going to focus again on how government speech reaches us and specifically presidential speech, right? This is something I've written um, a few pieces about. Um, and again, I think you could focus on government speech and the conveyance of government speech more broadly, but, but I'm gonna stay focused on presidential speech. Um, at the moment, um, my plan is to stay focused on um, 
President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his use of radio, and then Donald Trump um, and his use of Twitter. And as I think the first panel is making clear, you know, the book I think actually talks some, but you know, not excessively by any stretch about President Trump. It is a more lasting work. I think that's going to very much transcend the current moment. Um, but I think the amount of material around government speech that the Trump years have given us to work with means that most of these contributions are going to engage pretty deeply on the events that have sort of you know just transpired. Okay, so the government speech that I'm interested in um, typically doesn't involve these kind of first stage questions about whether the government in fact is speaking, um, right, whether this is actually government speech. You know, so one prominent example of the kind of speech I have in mind, which Professor Norton discusses a few times in the book, is the case of the, um, and Danielle mentioned, right, is the case of the lawsuit challenging President Trump's uh, decision to block critics on Twitter. Um, and in that case, DOJ did argue um, that the Twitter account from which these plaintiffs were blocked represented um, Donald Trump's private or personal speech, right, that the argument was basically that the at real Donald Trump account belonged to Donald Trump in his personal capacity. It predated the presidency. It would post-date the presidency. Um, it was subject to his personal control, not the control of the government, so that his decisions to block people uh, were not decisions made as a government actor, um, right? Not, didn't involve the use of, um, you know, power belonging to or conferred upon him by the federal government. And so his actions didn't implicate the First Amendment. Um, that argument was not successful in the district court, wasn't successful in the Second Circuit. I really wondered whether DOJ would renew the argument in its cert petition. It did. Um, but of course, the election of Joe Biden mooted the case. So we don't know what the Supreme Court would have made of that argument. Um, but I think that's kind of an exception. Most of the kinds of presidential speech that I'm interested in um, are very, you know, don't implicate these first order questions. It is speech of the president addressed the public as the president, um, and that much is clear. Um, so, but you know, sort of what happens in courts and you know in Congress and other venues to that speech are you know a, a, a number of interesting questions around all of that. But um, but you know, I'm at, you know in this paper more interested in these questions of sort of how the president interacts with the entities that convey that speech to the public. Um, okay, so look, it's at this point very well settled that presidential speech is obviously a key feature of presidential governance, right? Somewhere around the administrations, this is a point that Professor Norton makes in the book around either Teddy Roosevelt or Woodrow Wilson, uh, there's this transformation and presidents really begin taking their messages directly to the American people. And so whether that's a result kind of of Woodrow Wilson sort of deliberately remaking the presidency, right, to sort of create this rhetorical presidency in political science, scientist Jeff Toulis's terms, um, or has more to do with, um, you know, kind of changes in the media environment. Um, that's an argument that Sam Cornell makes in going public. Um, there's no question, right, that today the presidency is expected to engage in, right, constant public facing uh, discourse. But obviously the bully pulpit is not self-amplifying, right? Um, it's not something that the president just possesses by virtue of holding the office, but um, presidential speech relies on a lot of intermediaries to actually reach the public. Um, so of the presidents who have done, you know, kind of real innovation in using the media to transmit their messages to the public, I think the two most important examples are FDR and Donald Trump. Um, FDR and the radio, uh, Donald Trump and Twitter. Um, you know, so both very much innovated in their use of these media in both cases, largely to bypass a skeptical print press. Um, so let me talk for a little bit about FDR, a little bit about Trump, and then just maybe offer a few thoughts or questions about where I think the piece might go after laying this kind of groundwork. Um, okay, so FDR was not the first president to use the radio. So actually Wilson and Coolidge and Hoover all had, um, but he definitely used it in different and much more successful ways um, than any previous president had. So, right, you know, he understood very well, um, he'd used it in New York, um, the potential for direct contact and intimacy the, um, the, the medium of radio had. Um, he's quoted as saying, amid many developments which lead away from direct government by the people, radio is one which tends to restore contacts between the masses and their chosen leaders. Um, and as I just alluded to, FDR's use of radio was largely a strategy to bypass um, uh, the conservatism of the print press at the time. So major newspapers were run by conservatives like William Randolph Hearst. Um, here's a couple of examples in 1932 when FDR um, won 57% of the popular vote. He was the subject of favorable writings in 41% of daily papers. In 36, he won 60% of the popular vote, but received kind of favorable reviews um, or endorsements from 37% of um, daily papers in the country. Um, so there was a real disconnect between his popularity in the public broadly uh, and in the print press. And so radio was this hugely important um, mechanism by which he sought to kind of circumvent that skeptical um, print press, right? You know, sort of conservative capital, um, skeptical of a lot of the very progressive regulatory interventions that the administration wanted to make. 
Okay, so what was the regulatory apparatus in, in place at the time? Um, so it's in flux in those years. So in 1927, um, sorry, the Federal Radio Commission um, is created, right? It's basically just allocating early radio licenses. Uh, in 1934, um, Congress passes the Communications Act. It replaces the Federal Radio Commission with the Federal Communications Commission. Um, FDR actually had called on Congress to create the FCC. Um, you know, recommending that Congress create a new agency to be known as a Federal Communications Commission and, and Congress several months later does do that. Um, and so the FCC's early function is issuing licenses to radio stations, policing the nation's airwaves, has this very broad mandate to act um, to pursue public convenience, interest, necessity. Um, but so both prior to and um, following the creation of the FCC, FDR enjoys really broad access to the radio. Um, so he delivers his first famous fireside chat just eight days um, after taking office. He discusses the banking crisis that you know, he had stepped into immediately upon being inaugurated. It's this extraordinarily successful intervention that has a huge impact on the trajectory of that crisis. But that's eight days into his uh, first term. And he's actually already spoken on the radio twice by this point. So it's his third address. It's just his first of the kind of so-called so fireside chats. Um, in, this, in his first year in office, he gives 51 radio broadcasts. Um, so he uses radio constantly. Um, and in those early years, he kind of quietly exerts his influence over the FCC, um, both through appointments. So the FCC is kind of a patronage sort of bastion, um, but also, you know, takes a pretty laissez-faire approach to regulatory, to, to radio regulation. Um, so FDR appoints a lot of like sort of senior members of and friends of um, this kind of young radio industry um, on the FCC. Um, and there's just a general kind of message sent to stations that uh, both the kind of young radio networks and then to the ones that remained individually owned as stations that so long as they carried um, the president's addresses, they could expect a light regulatory touch. Um, and, and the exchange was successful, right? So all of these early broadcast networks and most individual stations basically guaranteed FDR um, airtime for his speeches at essentially um, any time. Um, there are accounts in the secondary literature of FDR threatening non-renewal of FCC licenses by radio stations, the independent ones that wouldn't carry his addresses. Um, there is one account of FDR instructing his press secretary, Stephen Early, to speak to the FCC chair um, about limiting radio station consolidation um, and acquisitions of radio stations by the print press, not out of a concern of consolidation or concentration, but simply of a, out of a concern uh, that the kind of antipathy in the print press would migrate to the radio. Um, and this was a real concern to FDR. Um, you know, at the time, it was you know, within several years of FDR taking office, 80% of American households had a radio. So this is an extraordinarily important uh, mechanism by which FDR directly reached the American public. Um, but there is real um, evidence in the secondary literature, at least, that there was, you know, at least a degree of coercion or manipulation happening inside government, um, sort of emanating from FDR and his administration with respect to the kind of mandate that his messages be carried. Um, there's some suggestion, although I'm not positive, I haven't run it down enough to sort of put it in a draft, um, that there were threats emanating from the White House that, about radio hosts um, who took espoused views that were critical of um, the Roosevelt administration um, being sort of quietly pushed out by leadership on urging on the urging of the administration. So, um, so I should say that you know the, the the secondary literature on this is pretty interesting and rich. Um, I'm spending most of the summer just by coincidence in upstate New York, pretty close to um, Hyde Park, where the FDR Library is. And my hope is that if it's open again this summer, I can actually spend some time um, in that collection. Something I've been meaning to do for you know, years anyway, and I'm really happy to have a chance to do. Um, so. Um, so I will say that, you know, again, I am very much in the research um, stage of this, but I do think that there's a pretty, it appears that there's a pretty interesting story, both obviously about FDR's circumvention of kind of a skeptical existing media infrastructure, um, but also, you know, the use of um, the regulatory state um, in service of, um, you know, both non-critical coverage, I think, um, but certainly in service of kind of the carriage of the message in an unneeded way uh, directly to the public. Okay, so that's FDR, so Trump. Um, there's a lot to say, obviously, about Trump um, and the press. Um, you know, maybe by way of background, um, I'll just mention that sort of the literature on you know what we can describe as like charismatic populist leaders um, of the sort that democratic like scholars of democratic decline are really interested in, um, and whether or not that label is exactly right for Donald Trump. Um, they share a lot of traits with Donald Trump, um, and so those kinds of scholars identify as a key feature of leaders of this sort. 
um, you know, a kind of tendency to demonize particular groups, right, subsets of the population, um, sometimes the press as a group, and that, you know, and that there is often as kind of part of the strategy or as a related strategy, um, you know, an effort to undermine or to discredit the press in addition to other kind of alternative sources of power and authority. Anyway, all of this is very familiar, right? This is something that President Trump engaged in uh, throughout his presidency, right? Casting the press as the enemy of the people, disparaging fake news, singling out press outlets and individual journalists for criticism and attack, tweeting memes alluding to violence, things like that. Um, he also pretty um, openly um, threatened kind of adverse regulatory action that was explicitly tied to what he perceived as critical coverage in the press. So um, for years, Trump both publicly um, and according to uh, reporting within the government sought to use the apparatus of state as a tool in his feud with Jeff Bezos, um, you know, obviously the owner of the Washington Post, but through using um, Amazon. Um, and I hasten to add, there may be very good reasons for singling out Amazon for different kinds of legal treatment, but I'm here talking about it in the context of a feud uh, between President Trump and Bezos. Um, so for years, it seems from um, significant, you know, a number of press accounts that Trump sought to double the rates the Postal Service charged Amazon for package delivery, um, suggested that his administration would be increasing antitrust scrutiny against Amazon. Um, so I'd say those are a couple of examples of use of both public facing rhetoric um, and at least threats to use the regulatory state to kind of punish um, to, to punish the sort of more traditional media. And then of course there's Trump and Twitter, right? So throughout his administration, Trump both said and demonstrated that Twitter was his kind of preferred means of communication. One that he said, um, not citing FDR, but you know, very much echoing um, FDR's sort of decisions um, allowed him to bypass traditional media that he viewed as kind of unfairly critical of him. Um, so for years, we're talking just about Twitter, there were you know, calls um, for Twitter to more actively moderate uh, President Trump's feed in the way that it did the feeds of many others. Um, it's pretty clear that a number of President Trump's tweets over the years would have led to suspensions um, if he had been anyone else, uh, but they did not. But for the first time in the summer of 2020, um, as the election approached and um, Trump's attacks on Twitter began kind of traversing more dangerous terrain with respect to um, this kind of obvious effort to preemptively discredit um, an election that he looked on the path to lose. Um, so Twitter actually for the first time began to actively moderate Trump's um, feed. Uh, so the first intervention in the summer of 2020 took the form of a warning flag that Twitter appended to two presidential tweets containing misinformation uh, about mail-in ballots. Um, you know, one claimed that the ballots would lead to a rigged election. The other, you know, falsely said California was giving was mailing everybody um, a ballot as opposed to just an application for a ballot. Um, so the president responded to this first wave of uh, warnings with this kind of dashed off executive order calling on federal agencies to revise their interpretation of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which has long provided right, a liability shield internet platforms, including Twitter. Um, so the order was both of you know dubious constitutionality and in any event kind of largely hortatory, um, but it was likely intended, at least in part, to dissuade Twitter from any further salvos right along those lines. Um, but the company wasn't persuaded. It didn't work if that was the intended effect. It kept placing warning labels on the president's tweets on January 6th, as Trump refused to forcefully condemn the storming of the Capitol both Twitter and Facebook, I'm focused on Twitter, but a lot of this uh, narrative applies to Facebook too, um, temporarily suspended Trump's accounts. Then on January 8th, Facebook announced that it was suspending uh, Trump's account at least until the end of the term. And Twitter on the same day um, announced that it was permanently suspending at least the uh, real Donald Trump account. Um, so there's a really important debate raging right about what sort of legal regulation entities like Twitter and Facebook should be subject to. They wield enormous power. I think people are unhappy for lots of different reasons with the current regulatory framework, but I'm going to try to largely avoid that debate. Um, but I, maybe I'll try to connect uh, all this back up to FDR uh, and then pose like a few uh, final questions. Okay, so both of these presidents confront a press that they uh, perceived to be hostile to them or sort of antithetical to aspects of their governing projects, um, both sought to respond to that using, you know, kind of both the bully pulpit and the sort of regulatory apparatus of government. Um, Trump's attempted interference was actually more public and transparent than FDR's, um, which mostly happened behind the scenes. Now, I should say we don't know what we don't know, and it is certainly possible that Trump was engaging in much more kind of internal to government efforts to bring the sort of pressure to bear that he was also bringing publicly. Um, I've thought about filing some FOIA requests on this point, but I'm still waiting for a lot of FOIA responses on my last project, and I'm not sure if I'm going to do that for this project. Um, but either way, 
Um, some of, so we know from reporting, there was some of this pressure inside government, but we also know that some of it happened, you know, in broad daylight. Um, and yet, Trump's actions feel much more disturbing than FDR's. Um, and that tuition, I, I wanna press on whether that tuition tells us something about the limits of transparency as a disciplining force, right? The transparency sometimes, um, you know, I, my general instinct is that transparency is often the best solution to thorny problems. But I do think there are hard questions that this study in contrasts kind of pose um, about you know, whether the public nature, so say what Trump was doing was just public and what FDR was doing was just behind the scenes. Um, does the public nature of Trump's attempts to coerce um, media make them more problematic? On the one hand, you know, the public can judge for themselves how to respond um, if they see in, in broad daylight what the president is seeking to do. Um, on the other hand, presidential speech has such power and it is so that maybe it's much more dangerous and damaging for this kind of thing to happen um, in public. And maybe here it's important to disaggregate, you know, the attacks on the press qua press and journal individual journalists from threats to use regulation against platforms and outlets, right? So maybe we want to say it, it really depends on what kind of presidential speech we're talking about. But maybe I'll, I'll close by saying I just I wonder whether this topic is a way to sort of try to think through some question questions sort of surrounding the rhetorical norms of the presidency and maybe kind of norms more broadly that sort of help us kind of probe more deeply. Um, more deeply than just the observation that one of the things that was so troubling about the Trump administration was its norm breaking, right? So norms can be hugely important. Was that the first? Okay, okay, oh, the second, okay. So so some norms, I'm, I'm not sure all norms have the same valence um, and I wonder whether this topic can help us sort of think through um, how to sift through the norms that are worth preserving the norms whose smashing um, are, are problematic and I have a better closing but I've run out of time for it. So, okay, so apologies again for the um, misfire before and thanks guys. Uh, great, thank you so much. So uh, we'll turn now to uh, questions. So uh, please just raise your virtual uh, hand, if you would like a question, uh, ask a question of any of our uh, our, our panelists. Okay, so um, I see Helen um, has her hand up in the air, uh, and so uh, Helen, uh, let's hear from uh, you first. So those were three exceptionally thoughtful and thought-provoking uh, talks. Thank you so much. I have a a question for each of you. Um, starting with Kate, who just finished off, I just love this project and thinking about both the harm and the value of presidents' unmediated speech directly to the public. And I, and I, I like thinking about the fact that transparency, which I usually think about as a value, could also actually be more complicated. And it had me thinking about other ways in which the president's direct unmediated speech might have different harm and value. And I'm thinking of Trump's speech on January 6th and to what extent does his direct speech to his to his folks increase its uh, potential for incitement because it is the president speaking directly without mediation? So I'd love to hear your reflections, um, Wendy and Claudia. I think this uh, the idea that your taxonomy was so helpful in thinking about what's going on here, and I I, I think you are really on to something with respect to thinking about tort law remedies. Um, as a constitutional law person, I was also wondering what you thought about the possibility that the government's lies about life-threatening lies about COVID could violate the due process clause. And here's where I'm coming from. When police officers lie to those in custody about legal rights, that's considered a violation of the due process clause, a deprivation of liberty without due process. I think, and I think um, Professor Torres Spellacy, we'll find out later, thinks this as well, when the government lies about voting in a way that has the intent or the effect of interfering with voting, that that should be understood as a violation of the due process clause. And I'm wondering too, in that same vein, if the government's lies about COVID or other life-threatening matters could under certain circumstances be considered the deprivation of life or, or health without adequate justification. Uh, and again, in violation of the due process clause. And then finally, Danielle, sort of a similar um, question for you. You have been so creative for so long in thinking not only about how we describe the harms of certain choices, right? Harms in terms of threats to cyber civil rights, harms in terms of privacy, et cetera. You've been so creative and effective in identifying a wide range of remedies for them. And here too, I wonder if um, there's room for the due process clause to do some work with respect to governmental officials' disclosure of certain intimate matters. 
um, and I'm thinking about this, the Third Circuit case that I'm sure you're aware of, Sterling versus Borough of Minersville, where the police office, uh, its police department in a small town disclosed a young man's sexual orientation to his family, that, and it led to his um, suicide. And the appellate court was willing to see a due process problem with the government's disclosure of intimate information without adequate justification. And I wonder if at least some of the disclosures that you described might fit into that um, realm as well. But again, thanks so much to all three of you. Uh, so I'm gonna actually gather um, additional questions. Uh, so uh, Mary Rose, um, why don't you go next and then Alex, and then after we hear uh, from the three sets of questioners, we can go to the presenters to, to comment as they, as they wish. So uh, Mary Rose. Woohoo, I'm next, awesome. I'm so excited to be here. I'll save my remarks for later. But anyway, um, all these presentations were wonderful. I did wanna um, focus on Wendy and Claudia's paper first. Um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about some sort of first amendment defenses that might come into play if there were a tort claim brought against a public official. And um, among other things, I'm curious about the relevant intent standard you think might be required to for any um, tort liability. Okay, great. And uh, Alex, do you want to ask your question? Yes, thank you so much. Thanks, Jason. Um, so I have a question both for Wendy and Claudia and uh, one for Kate. Uh, so looking at the chart, uh, you know, we distinguish between Fauci and Scott Atlas and those other categories. I wonder whether it's too reductivist, whether there needs to be more nuance to this. And that might be brought out in text, if, if, but some way, you know, looking at school principals on one side and mass, requiring masks on the other side, rejecting, and then in that same column, Biden above one and Trump on the other, it, there has to be clarification, I think. The other thing is that in your, I, I really am, was really interested in your comments uh, in which you used democratic accountability today. It seemed to me to, about, to be exclusively about elections. I didn't understand that from the, the, the outline. And I wonder whether you have a broader picture or whether that, that's, in other words, I, I, you, please define, I would suggest defining democratic accountability because it's such a central concept. Uh, and so my suggestion of what to do as a solution, I really don't know either, I wonder, but it, it's a great project is whether section 1983 would be relevant, right? Where, but then you still need standing and you still need particularized harm and deprivation of rights, privileges and immunities under the constitution and laws. Uh, Kate, uh, I, uh, this is really a, a, obviously an extremely important and fascinating uh, project as we're all, all, th all three of the presenters. Um, I want to take you a little bit um, in a broader, in a, in a field you didn't talk about, but I would really be interested to know in what sense does Brandenburg enter here? Do, does it have any effect on, on Trump's uh, incitement to insurrection, which was the second article of impeachment that was voted against him. Thanks. Okay, and let's get Clifford in uh, too. Uh, thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be here, and I enjoyed all of the papers. I do have a very specific uh, question for Kate, um, which is: I, I loved uh, this. I've just been noodling on. You say there's these two instances, FDR and Trump, and and one is the intuition is that Trump's is more disturbing, and and. Um, I just wanted to, um, so I've been pondering that ever since you asked that. I mean, obviously, uh, different political parties, <laughs> different times, right? Um, oh, but I wonder how much, number one, the substance of what the president was trying to communicate to the public. I mean, FDR was sort of vindicated by history as saving us from the Great Depression. Uh, that's not the narrative uh, <laughs> um, with Trump um, uh, and the Capitol at all. Um, but then also the regulatory baselines, right? The regulatory baseline, as this court has recognized um, in radio, is much it's much more regulated. Um, and so FDR trying to influence the content of radio, disturbing, yes, but not unusual. There's the FCC. Whereas with Trump and Twitter, the regulatory baseline is something like zero, net neutrality, whatever, you know. So um, 
uh, but that there's just not much there, right? And I was just wondering if, uh, if you thought either of those might have some way of explaining the different moral intuitions. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so that's a lot on the table. So let's uh, hear from the uh, respondents, um, I'm, I'm sorry, the presenters. Um, so uh, Claudia and uh, Wendy, do you wanna go first and just sort of pick up on uh, whichever points you'd like to respond to? Um, yeah, so let's see. Um, first of all, thank you um, so much for these comments. It's, that's really helpful because we're, we're, at the, we're at the very beginning of this. So uh, Helen, I love the, the due process idea. I, we haven't thought, we haven't, well, we haven't really discussed it yet. So that is definitely something that, that I think we should, um, we should look into um, a lot more. So that, that's, a, that's, a great, um, that's a great suggestion. Um, uh, Mary Rose, um, so great to see you. Hi. Uh, <laughs> I know this is so sad. I would like to echo what Danielle said. The like lack of hugs is really not uh, not nice. Um, anyway, so the yes. Yeah, so I think you know my initial reaction um, is um, that that actually depends on how close we think this might be to um, uh, to malpractice, right? I mean, it, the 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 sort of First Amendment, uh, the lack of First Amendment defense really is only I think. Um, uh, doable if there's if there's this focus on expertise within within that type of relationship, and I think the closer we can get the analogy to actually having to communicate um, uh, information aligned with expertise in that context too, I think the more likely we'll be to get around First Amendment defenses. Um, but that really depends, I think, on the strength of, of the analogy that, that we can make there. And so, um, but it's definitely definitely something that, that we're gonna have to address head on because that's right, sort of the, the, the main point of, of making that, that analogy. Um, Alex, yes, that is very, um, that's very helpful. I think the chart, you know, the chart really was sort of a, a starting point and a sort of, you know, very rough taxonomy um, and absolutely, there's going to uh, have to be more nuance in the text. There's also there are also a wide range of statements that that we had in um, in mind, and and I think for the for the chart, we only took the sort of um, the the most extreme um, uh, you know uh, egregious examples. Um, but the more you and this is and this is I think a larger point too beyond sort of what we're trying to do in the chart. The, the more you get away from a settled consensus, which, which you know, as, on the one hand is sort of typical for scientific um, expertise anyway, but especially in a pandemic that's sort of happening in real time, um, the more we get away from consensus, the more difficult it gets for us to make this type of argument. And so I think it's not only the speakers that we have to look at, but also the content of, of what they were saying in relation to um, the content of what the scientific um, I don't even want to say consensus, but the scientific sort of um, uh, insights at the moment were. Um, and I'll see if Wendy has anything to add. I think I want to just very quick think first of all, share Claudia's uh, appreciation for these really thoughtful comments. Um, and they will definitely be of great help to us as we work on this project, which we really are in the early stages of um, just two quick thoughts. Um, one about 1983, and this might also go to the, the due process issue, is I think we've been somewhat attracted to look more at tort law because of sort of the, I guess, narrowing um, scope and, and increasing difficulty, some of which have been mentioned about bringing 1983 claims. Um, that said, I think there is a, a due process argument to be made, even if it would be even more difficult uh, to attain judiciability for the 1983 claims. The accountability issue is a really important and complicated one. I mean, separately, there's a enormous discussion and debate going on in the country about accountability for public health. There's a movement of state legislatures to claw back power from health officials. And 
you know, one of the issues with that is that, again, it, it's, it's coming from an increasingly politicized place, not necessarily for any concern or respect from science. Um, how to conceptualize accountability here, how to get it right so that there is democratic accountability in addition, um, that's not just elections, but that isn't just throwing scientific facts in a sense, and I understand that word itself is at times controverted now, you know, to the next election process is obviously a, a really important question. I don't think we can completely grapple with that fully in this paper, although it's part of some other projects we're working on, but I appreciate the comments and the need to be careful and to be reflective and to at least tag these bigger issues about what accountability means in general and, and for public health in particular. Great, uh, thank you. So we have about uh, five minutes uh, left uh, for this first panel. Um, and so uh, Danielle, and then, uh, then we'll go to Kate. Uh, any responses that you'd like to offer at this point? So just really quickly, because Kate, I want you to have the full basically five minutes, but just, um, what do they say, Hala, Helen, um, at the shout out to the undervalued and underappreciated rights information privacy in the due process clause, Whalen versus Rose. So I think that's really astute and smart and right. Um, and Kiara Bridges has a wonderful book called The Poverty of Privacy Rights in which she develops sort of the idea not only of disclosure of, of intimate information, but, and she's not as focused so much on intimate information, but the collection, how demeaning the collection can be too. So thank you so much, Kate. Um, sure, maybe I'll take Helen and Alex's comments, questions together. Yes, I mean, absolutely, as to January 6th, I do think that President Trump's speech prior to the storming of the Capitol warranted, you know, those were, that was incitement to violence, it warranted impeachment, it may well under Brandenburg um, support criminal charges and conviction. I, I'm not sure it's a clear case, but I think it's certainly a quite plausible case. So absolutely, as to all of that, Either way, the speech was extremely dangerous and more dangerous because, you know, made publicly, I would say, to Helen's question. Um, and so I think maybe that question underscores the importance of drawing a line between the kinds of attacks on journalists that I alluded to and the sort of public calls for increased regulation, which, like, as I sat, sat and thought about it, you know, actually, you know, Elena Kagan's presidential administration celebrates both presidential ownership over and kind of presidential rhetorical appropriation of the sort of output of the regulatory state. And so, you know, it, again, is there some value in, in making these calls public as compared to private, if that is the choice, if we are already in a sphere in which the president is going to be seeking to leverage his power authority in some fashion vis-a-vis -vis the regulatory state. And to Clifford's question, that I means so, so much interesting stuff there. I mean, certainly it matters, the substance of the communication. Um, and I think that vindicated by history is one way to think about sort of why we might be more comfortable with one intervention versus the other. Um, I would like to find some, you know, neutral feeling principles that would ex ante give us some guidance. And I mean, it may be that in, in a way that would say, you know, whether it's, you know, President AOC 30 years from now, or try seeking to aggressively, you know, coerce or convince the press to you know, favorably coverage an ambitious Green New Deal that's actually literally going to save us from existential crisis or a President Tom Cotton seeking to pressure the press to do the opposite. Do we need neutral principles that can give us a sense ex ante of the permissibility in both of those cases? And maybe just, let me just say one more thing. In addition to kind of moral intuitions, I think there actually is kind of a political economy point about the distinction between those two cases, which is like any genuinely transformational like left president who's a head of state in a capitalist country is going to come up against sort of concentrated economic powers and resistance. And maybe there is a distinction to be drawn between using speech and the regulatory state in service of, you know, countering that those kinds of powers as opposed to consistent deploying them consistent with those already accrued powers. I'll stop there. But thank you very much. Uh, great. Uh, thanks so much. Um, uh, so this is a good point to uh, stop uh, for the moment. We have about a, a 10 minute break. So we will uh, resume uh, at 1130 um, Central Time, 12 30 Eastern time. Um, I look forward to seeing you back then. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for just wonderful presentations that a great way to get us started. <laughs>
Okay, so uh, welcome back. Uh, and uh, this session we have uh, we have four papers, um, and we're going to start with uh, with Bill uh, Ariza from Brooklyn Law School. So, uh, Bill, over to you. Great, thank you, uh, thank you, Jason. Can uh, can people hear me? I just want to make sure that my great. Thank you. All right. So while I get my screen up, let me just uh, thank um, the law review for having me. Thank uh, Helen Norton for writing such an extraordinarily rich book. It's just I was rereading it yesterday, and it was really such a joy and so many ideas popping up as I was reading it. So I'm just delighted to be here. Um, so my topic uh, is government speech and equal protection animus. Um, and I will be talking about this, co this, this, co this concept um, in the context in which government speech uh, intersects with claims of equal protection animus. Uh, I will not discuss situations in which government raises the government speech argument in defense to a private party's claim of a First Amendment violation. In other words, I will not discuss situations where a private party wants to speak but encounters the government's uh, refusal based on a claim that really that speech is the government's own. In other words, I'm not going to be talking about cases like Summum and Sons of Confederate Veterans. Instead, uh, I'm going to be speaking about um, situations where government wishes to speak uh, but encounters a private party claim that particular government speech violates equal protection. This kind of case would arise, for example, when state government chooses to fly a Confederate battle flag or when it adopts a so-called no promo homo curriculum in public schools. Now, conceptually, uh, these claims are straightforward. The plaintiff alleges that the um, that uh, uh, state action, that is to say the government speech, that violates equal protection. The government counters by claiming a right to speak and presumably also by denying that the speech actually violates equal protection. But nevertheless, these claims raise two discrete issues. Number one, how government speech might be thought to violate equal protection. And number two, whether the First Amendment adds anything to the analysis. So I'll start with the first issue before proceeding on to the second. The equal protection claim requires us to start uh, with two, in turn, preliminary issues. Uh, first, we need to ask whether the state is actually sending a message at all. Uh, this harkens back to Plessy versus Ferguson and the Plessy court's infamous explanation that if the African-American community viewed a Louisiana train law as connoting their inferiority, that inferiority message was one that the African-American community itself chose to place on the law rather than a message sent by the state. Um, as scholars have recognized, the court's argument implicates the state action idea without actually mentioning the term by suggesting that whatever the state was doing by passing the Louisiana law, it was not communicating a message of inferiority. Of course, um, in official state flag cases or school curriculum cases, it's hard to deny that messages are in fact being communicated by the state. The question then becomes, does the flag or curriculum actually communicate a message of inferiority? So that question in turn takes us to Palmer v. Thompson and cases like it. So Palmer was the 1971 case where Jackson, Mississippi decided to close or transfer to private ownership its public swimming pools rather than integrate them after a court, conclude, after a court holding that that segregation was unconstitutional. A bare majority, five justice, five justice majority of the court uh, rejected the claim that the closure itself violated the equal protection rights of African Americans since both blacks and whites were denied the ability to use the pool. Hence in this slide, the empty pool that no one gets to use. Uh, in so reasoning, Justice Black's majority opinion rejected the argument that any city purpose to prevent integration was by itself, just that bare purpose, was by itself adequate to violate equal protection without an actual differential material effect on the black plaintiffs. So let's assume now that the state is in fact acting, that's the Plessy issue, and number two, that the more direct communication allowed in our hypothetical cases, the flag and the curriculum cases, serves to distinguish Palmer. Whether courts would actually buy that or not, we can talk about that, but let's make that assumption. The question then becomes, um, what's the result? What's the equal protection result? But before we even get to that equal protection analysis, we need to add some more complicating possibilities. 
The first complication arises if the state is speaking not on its own account, so to speak, but in support of other private parties' constitutional rights. Now, this requires a tweak to the hypos. Let's think about the curriculum hypo. Here would be the situation. Hypothesize that rather than simply enacting a no promo homo uh, public school curriculum, the state instead uh, endorsed or recognized the rights of private or other, uh, sorry, uh, of religious or other private groups to consider homosexuality to be immoral. Endorsing private views, in other words, rather than stating the state's own views. Now, that template might sound familiar. It's basically the template from Reitman versus Mulkey, uh, Reitman's 1967 case uh, involving a situation where California was accused of violating equal protection by endorsing private discriminatory acts by constitutionalizing, putting into state constitution, uh, the right to discriminate. Um, consider then of state law that rather than instituting a no promo homo curriculum in public schools, explicitly authorizes private schools to institute that sort of curriculum. In the current political environment, one can easily understand the attractiveness of that sort of, 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 of policy decision. But even this hypo needs to be further complexified. What changes, if anything, if the discrimination the government chooses to endorse is understood as reflecting the exercise of a constitutional right? What if, for example, the discrimination that the state endorses is grounded in constitutionally protected religious beliefs? Indeed, even a secular private school would presumably have a First Amendment right to express disapproval of homosexuality. What result if the government expresses its endorsement of that private group's constitutional right to disapprove of homosexuality? Okay, so let's recap. We started by asking, as Plessy did, whether the inequality message was really emanating from the government itself. We then, we then asked whether the government could even potentially violate equal protection by sending a message. That's, of course, the Palmer question. Um, finally, we complicated matters by asking whether a government sent message merely encouraging private conduct um, changes the analysis, especially when that endorsed private conduct is itself protected by the Constitution. Okay. So now that we have set up the equal protection questions, I'd like to shift the analysis to the government speech issue to see whether that helps us resolve these questions as we set them out. First, we should confront the question whether the government can, whether the government can be said to have First Amendment rights at all. Presumably, we all agree that the government should be able to speak, but does this right rest on the First Amendment or does it rest on something else? Writing 20 years ago, uh, Randy Bizanson and William Buss wrote pretty persuasively, in my view, that government should not be thought of as having First Amendment rights of its own. Their conclusion makes an awful lot of sense. Um, government itself has no self-actualization need to speak. The contribution of government speech to self-government raises really difficult questions of coherence and circularity, and given its power, Government is very often a threat to the marketplace, more of a threat to the marketplace rather than a valuable contributor. Indeed, the fact that government can threaten the marketplace also suggests that government speech may be a threat to self-government itself. Still, this is not to say that government has no business speaking. Government plainly has legitimate reasons for speaking all the time. Um, indeed, it's often necessary and proper for government to speak in order to accomplish, for example, its regulatory goals. A government anti-smoking program may involve prohibitions, regulations, taxes, but government speech urging people not to smoke, like for example, this FDA speech that you see on the screen, um, uh, is surely a legitimate component of any government regulation program. So perhaps the key here is uh, 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 is to think about the, uh, uh, the appropriate realm for government speech as a matter of regulation. The idea is that to the extent that government speech is incident to its legitimate regulatory activities, it should be able to speak. Now, this would help answer some of the difficult questions we raised earlier. If the government's regulatory end is legitimate, then presumably you should have the authority to speak in order to promote those ends. 
obviously this idea of the language I'm using harkens back to the necessary and proper clause, but you get the underlying idea. If government has a right to regulate in this area, then speech as part of that regulation is presumptively legitimate. Doesn't mean that all such regulatory speech is therefore necessarily constitutional, um, but it does, I think, place the constitutional issue in the right place. In the balance between individuals' equality rights and government regulation, that's the proper balance, I think, rather than trying to balance individuals' equality rights on the one hand and government's First Amendment rights on the other. I think that's sort of the, uh, in, uh, that's sort of the wrong way to look at the issue. I think this answers a lot of problems, but it doesn't answer all the problems. Because frankly, part of government's legitimate activity is to express community views and community values. There's no regulatory need to celebrate July 4th as a federal holiday, to put a motto on a license plate, or indeed to adopt a certain flag design. So does that mean that the federal government could mark as a national holiday the day in 1619 that African slaves were first brought to the shores of Virginia if the government decided that it wants to valorize that day? This question seems to me to raise a hard issue. What is the limit of government's purely expressive speech as opposed to its speech that's incident to legitimate regulation? Now, of course, if the government, if the government has First Amendment rights, that's an easy question. Government, like any other First Amendment speaker, has the right to say whatever it wants, to express whatever viewpoint it wants. But obviously that argument proves way too much. Because that would mean that the government, for example, has the First Amendment right to glorify slavery or condemn Mormons. If we try to prohibit such government speech within the context of government having First Amendment rights, then we will end up seriously distorting First Amendment doctrine. So I think a better approach maybe is to focus on government interests and to ask whether government's interest in expressing a certain viewpoint is sufficient to justify the inequality message that viewpoint communicates. Now, this may sound like a prescription for a very vague balancing test, but equal protection animus doctrine, I think, steps into the breach and helps us get a handle on this situation. At base, animus doctrine cuts through the mediating principles of suspect class and tiered scrutiny analysis to cut to the core of the equal protection question, which is whether government is acting for a bad reason. Uncovering that motive can take the form of eliminating potential legitimate justifications for the government action, as for example, the court did in the canonical city of Cleburne case from 1985. That focus on government motivation, irrational prejudice to use Cleburne's term, can help us understand challenges to government speech that's alleged to violate equal protection. Purely expressive government speech, that is to say, speech that's not incident to any legitimate government regulatory program, that expressive speech should be understood as violating the animus principle to the extent it is motivated simply by a desire to oppress. And the idea here is that there is simply no leg legitimate justification for, for that kind of speech, even for purely expressive reasons. In other words, government simply has no legitimate interest in approving of racial inequality or various other types of inequality. For that reason, speech expressing that approval should fall as government action that lacks any legitimate purpose. Now, let me close by restating my tentative conclusion about government speech, and I really, really do mean tentative. Um, if the government has First Amendment rights, then presumably it would have the right to express discriminatory views, just like anyone else does, as long as it doesn't act on them. Another way to say this is that if government had classic First Amendment rights, it wouldn't need a justification for acting. The fact that it wants to express that viewpoint is enough. But that's a very problematic conclusion. It would require us to figure out a way to meaningfully balance a First Amendment right, here belonging to the government, with an equality right. To be sure, we do that balancing when government regulates private speech, for example, hate speech, in order to vindicate equality rights. But in that case, the government is acting as a regulator rather than a speaker in its own right, and that's a very, very different situation calling for a very different kind of balance. Of course, we could try to distort First Amendment doctrine by providing special rules for the government's own First Amendment claims. For example, perhaps we could insist on real democratic control of that government speech. But given the anti-majoritarian ideal of equal protection, it's hard to see how democratic approval of oppressive speech somehow makes it better for the, uh, and defeats the equal protection claim. For these reasons, it's probably a good thing that we simply leave First Amendment doctrine alone 
and consider the government's right to speak solely in terms of whether that speech furthers a legitimate government interest and refrains from oppressing any group. We should demand no less from the government, and animus doctrine provides a meaningful mechanism for imposing that sort of limitation on government speech. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Bill. And our next speaker is uh, Mary, uh, Mary Rose Papandrea from UNC. Hi, everybody. Um, it's such an exciting honor to be here. I'm so excited to celebrate Helen's book with all of you kind and reasonable people, to use Helen's phrase, which I loved. Um, so this is a wonderful wide ranging book. And like Kate, I think she said she thought she'd go in six different directions. And, and then she settled on one. And I've decided to go in lots of, of different directions. And instead, I'm going to talk about different methods of countering destructive government speech just more generally. Um, I think this fits um, with what I've been writing about my whole career. And Helen's book has given me a, a framework for putting together a lot of the things I've been thinking about. Um, I realize that a lot of my work fits as an examination of some of the structural issues um, with the First Amendment. And so I'm going to use her book as a, as a way of um, putting together a lot of things I've been thinking about for my whole career. So this is not a surprising conclusion, but my ultimate conclusion in my article is that countering destructive government speech is extraordinarily difficult. Um, the existing constitutional protections for people and entities that try to challenge our government, the government speech are weak at best. Uh, we can do some things to bolster these protections or we can evolve the doctrine, um, but by far our most successful to tools historically, and I think going forward will be to focus on our, and these are hard things to do, our social norms um, and making sure we have a robust press and civic education. Um, so in chapter seven, Helen outlines how to counter destructive government speech. She begins with constitutional litigation and then she quickly turns to other methods of countering government speech that don't involve litigation. Helen is absolutely right to recognize that constitutional litigation offers very little chance of countering the biggest problems with government speech today, although many of you have some great ideas, so maybe that will change. Um, and um, instead we need to focus on other avenues. Um, structural challenges to our system of free expression are everywhere, and Helen's book outlines many of them. Um, I'm going to talk about some of them and add a few more for good measure. Um, not surprisingly, given my media law background, my focus will be on the role of the press and their sources, which includes government employees. Um, okay, so first, I, I really like this framework of first order and second order um, government speech problems, and so I'm going to say a word about these first order problems, which I have obsessed over. Um, and I think it's probably one of the reasons why I'm here today because I have obsessed over this. Um, one issue we've seen in cases like Sumim and Walker um, is whether there's a creation of a public forum or whether the government is the one speaking at all. You know, notice in the second order speech problems, it's not as common where we're fighting over that. We know it's the government speaking, but then what do we do about that? Um, so back to the first order problems. Um, uh, uh, one of the issues is um, how do we make this determination? And as um, Helen um, quotes Mattel in her book, it's clear that the government speech doctrine is a doctrine that is susceptible to dangerous misuse. Um, now it's really difficult now after cases like Walker and then the Mattel, the Tam case to figure out what's going on in this area. It's very hard to predict whether, when and whether a court will decide that the government is speaking or whether the government has created a forum. Unlike many other areas of the government's, of the court's First Amendment doctrine, the jurisprudence in the government speech area does not rest on bright line rules. Um, instead, the court has explicitly embraced this many factor approach, including an increasing reliance on these very mushy practical implications. So in my view, and I think Helen and I disagree a little bit about this, but I think this doctrine is virtually um, nonsensical and, and illustrated when the dissent in the Walker decision essentially became the majority in the Mattel case. Um, so um, uh, even if the court, even when the court decides uh, that the government has created some sort of form, um, sorry, I'm sorry, the court has been in this area 
very reluctant to apply its, its sort of more normal, um, uh, robust First Amendment protections that we see in the court's other uh, uh, cases outside of the government speech doctrine. Um, and it might be that it's just it, because this is so tricky. It's just so tricky. And so we need a new approach. And it's, uh, it's a new, relatively new doctrine. And so we have the freedom to do what we want. But um, in my view, this distorted and inconsistent analysis that we see coming from the court in these cases leaves me with the distinct impression that the court is embracing a First Amendment it sort of kind of wishes it had instead of the one that we do have. So um, for example, in the First Amendment doctrine that we do have outside of this um, uh, outside of um, the government speech doctrine. We see the court extraordinarily hostile to viewpoint discrimination, doesn't allow the government to prohibit hate speech or um, uh, make decisions about what speech is high speech and low speech, unless it falls within a category of unprotected speech or lesser protected speech. Um, and also um, it doesn't allow the government to decide where speakers get to choose to speak unless we're talking about a content neutral time, place and manner restriction. Um, and so in this way, the government speech doctrine illustrates um, some much bigger tensions that we see within the broader First Amendment doctrine. Um, and, uh, you know, I met like, uh, uh, I just a little diversion here, Sasha's question earlier about the incitement line of cases, you know, I think that that's another tension we see um, coming up, um, maybe more in second order cases, but there's, a, there's it, I think it's a fascinating lens to see where the core is um, maybe these fault lines on First Amendment doctrine generally are playing themselves out in the government speech doctrine. Okay, the second point I want to make about first order problems is that um, is about this transparency principle and how it, it doesn't work as well in, in the context of some of these cases. I love the transparency principle. I am a long fan of government transparency. Um, and I, I, I'm not saying that Helen's wrong to insist on transparency. I agree. It is essential. I think the point that I wanted us to talk more about is what work can transparency do? Like how much work does it do? And, um, and, the, and the theory is with transparency that um, you know, if the public knows the government is the one speaking, not the private actor, that then the government is subject to political checks like voting, lobbying, petitioning, and protesting. Um, but I am a little worried, uh, particularly in this context, about having too much faith in what um, transparency can do. Um, number one, there's sort of a, a meta problem with transparency that some scholars have started to bring up, like David Posen in the FOIA context has written thoughtfully about this. Um, there, are, there are many other scholars. So um, this is a, something maybe to, to, to examine in this context to bring in some of that literature and think about transparency um, in that in this context now. Um, the, we know one big problem is we have to assume that people will care enough to do anything about any particular thing they find out about. Um, you know, are they actually going to take to the streets um, if they disagree about someone not being able to put their name on a park bench in the school's uh, fundraiser? You know, like these are these are not things that necessarily drive heated political action, much less be the deciding factor when they vote and go to the polls, right? So that's a that's a that's a real like practical problem, you know? So like we have the theory and then we have uh, some practical issues. Um, but the other thing is that transparency might work pretty well in cases like Russ v. Sullivan, where you're talking about abortion and people care, there's like heated political debate about abortion rights, but it's going to look work less well when we're talking about minority voices like the Suman religious group or the Sons of Confederate Veterans. Um, you know, a lot of people, this kind of goes back to point number one, where we're sort of abandoning our usual principles in the First Amendment doctrine that, um, that you know, no one's going to take to the, not a, bit, a lot of people, not a majority will take to the streets to defend a minority. That's the whole point of the court's First Amendment current doctrine that is so protective of minority speakers. So um, anyway, that's, that's an interesting point there. Okay, second stage problems in my remaining time. I don't even know how much time I have. I'm going to go with like maybe Four minutes, Jason. Does that sound about right? Um, you have uh, three minutes left. Three minutes. Okay. So that's all right. I have written about all of these things. You have one of my minutes. Take one of mine. Oh, okay. Well, I'm, I'm just going to summarize um, 
things I've written about in many other places. And I think you'll, in my shorthand, you'll understand the concern. So the second stage problems where the government is clearly speaking, but maybe engaging in, in, um, in uh, uh, destructive speech or not revealing information at all, like silences. And uh, that's interesting, like not telling us things. Um, so how do we go about countering this? How do we deal with this problem? Um, so one thing is uh, defamation law can protect speakers who try to challenge the government, right? And um, so we have the New York Times v. Sullivan case, most important case I contend that in the First Amendment, uh, but as you all know, very much in the debate now, we have Silverman and Thomas all questioning um, this. So who knows what's gonna happen to that? Um, even with Sullivan on the books, it doesn't provide absolute protection. There's always a risk of litigation. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's an, a weak point perhaps. Um, in defending Sullivan going forward, and I don't kid myself, we probably are going to have to do that at some point. I love Danielle's suggestion of making sure we reframe, um, she didn't talk about this particular issue, but reframe um, or, or focus, I should say, on the importance of defamation um, protections or constitutional protection and defamation actions as a um, important element of countering government, um, government speech and its of civil rights um, protection. Um, okay, we have FOIA litigation. That's another way of like getting information the government doesn't want to share with us or maybe getting proper information. Um, FOIA is a hot mess. I could move on to my next topic, but I think I, you know, that is just a total disaster. It's expensive, it's time consuming, the coverage is limited. It's a Swiss cheese of a statute with exceptions you could drive, not just one Mack truck, maybe like a whole fleet of Mack trucks through that. Um, uh, there, the, another problem is that's a statutory right, not a constitutional right. And there's a very limited constitutional right for any government information outside of say, criminal proceedings and, um, and related proceedings. Um, so uh, I, I get there are so many logistical problems with recognizing a broad constitutional right to government information. My husband's advocated for this. We fight about it all the time about how it would possibly work. And I know it probably won't work. FOIA is an illustration of how poorly logistically, practically it would work. But I think we might have have to think about this. We might need to give this a closer look because we have an ongoing collapse of the customary press norms that give um, access um, to information um, and the government's increasing desire to operate out of the public view. We just may we just may need to go down this road. And I will say that one promising development in the court system is uh, the lower courts appear to be um, uh, in agreement, at least to the extent they've considered it, that there's a First Amendment right to record the police. This, um, this is uh, based on a theoretical um, conclusion that uh, recording the, the, the police is part of the speech process. So perhaps we could push that doctrine and recognize that getting government information is also part um, of the speech process and protected under the First Amendment. Um, all right, quickly, I'll just say there is uh, no robust protection for um, uh, reporters. Uh, the Brandsburg decision that said reporters have to testify in grand jury proceedings. It's a mishmash of statutes. If you're in a state court, you might get protection. If you're in federal court, you rest on the attorney general's um, discretion to, 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 um, to, uh, to call or not call a reporter, um, depends on the proceeding. Um, and, and where you are. Protections for publishing national security information. Once you get it, we have Pentagon Papers case, but that's a prior restraint case. Doesn't answer uh, subsequent punishment. Um, uh, and we see the Julian Assange prosecution, another uh, like the Sons of Confederate Veterans, not very popular, but yet dramatically posing a danger um, to First Amendment rights if that prosecution goes forward and is successful. We have the, um, Helen and I have loved to write about the government employee speech um, is, is also uh, not robustly protected. Um, we see leakers get no protection. They're very weak whistleblower protections, particularly for national security 
um, employees. We've seen recently the um, brought to light the um, the the uh, pre-publication review for government authors who have access to classified information that is broken. The SNEP decision, maybe one of the worst decisions um, the court ever made, upholding a prior restraint and a constructive trust over the profits, even if there was no classified information in the work. Um, and um, and then okay, so I'm going to conclude. I'm probably over time, but okay. Attacks on the press. In her book, Helen talks about attacks on the press and perhaps the need to define the press. And um, I, I personally, I don't think that's going anywhere anytime soon. I love Sonia West's like valiant, you know, she keeps trying, uh, but I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon. Um, uh, I will say that the tension between the president and the press is natural and longstanding. I love Kate's uh, work here. I can't wait to see your article, Kate. Very interesting to show us that what we think is new may not be as new as we think it is. Um, but I think what this all shows us is we have much bigger structural problems. Um, the government leaders are able to bypass the press as our gatekeepers and go straight to Twitter or whatever. And maybe if they're outrageous enough, they'll get thrown off. But that's you know only if they're outrageous enough. Um, and we also should keep in mind the government is not just the president, but includes state and local government. And right now we have news deserts. There are no coverage, no one holding people's feet to the fire. And so this is a really big problem. So we need to build up our press. We need to get creative to figure out some financial models. But most of all, and I know this is probably the hardest thing to achieve, and it will take perhaps decades, but we need to invest in civic education. People need to understand how their government works. They need to care and they need to know how to seek redress and accountability. So I'll end there. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, next up is Clifford Ruski from University of Utah. Uh, thank you. I'll say my computer has a problem picking up my image um, on Zoom. I, I know you all can hear me. Oh, there we go. That's, that's what I was going to ask for. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm so grateful to be here and to join you all in celebrating Professor Norton's outstanding book. I owe a, a debt of gratitude, and I think we all do. For a moment, just try to imagine her foresight. She's been writing about government speech for 17 years, since 2004. 2004 wasn't just the year that Johans versus Livestock Association was decided. It was also five years before Donald Trump even had a Twitter account and a dozen years before he was elected president. The prescience of this work just boggles the mind. So I'll just begin by saying thank you and congratulations, not only for your wonderful book, but your impressive body of scholarship on this important and timely topic. I hope you enjoy watching your own work becoming so relevant and sparking so many new lines of inquiry for other scholars. And of course, I'd also like to thank Catherine and Youngley and a long list of students at the Illinois Law Review who I haven't met yet. I appreciate your hard work in pulling this event together and I look forward to working with you this fall. In her book's introduction, Professor Norton hints at what I think is a fascinating little aspect of government speech doctrine, one of the few that she doesn't have time to fully examine in the book itself. Uh, she writes, quote, the full range of the government's expressive choices includes not only its affirmative speech, but also its secrets and its silences. And governmental silences, she explains, reflect the government's decision not to express its views on a contested policy issue or crisis examples of the government's silences abound. Indeed they do. And in this essay or talk, I'd like to ask how we might build on Professor Norton's theory of government speech by considering whether and when the government's silence might violate the Equal Protection Clause. I've been playing around with different titles, but for now let's call this Don't Say Gay, Government Silence and the Equal Protection Clause. I met uh, Professor Norton a few years ago when she reached out to me. She was writing this incredible book, and I was at the time writing an article on what I call anti-gay curriculum laws. They're often known as no promo homo or don't say go gay laws. Uh, these are statutes that prohibit or restrict the discussion of homosexuality in public schools. Now, once you've read Professor Norton's book, the link between these two topics becomes crystal clear. Curriculum laws regulate the content and the viewpoint of what teachers teach students in public schools. And after Garcetti, it seems at least plausible to ask whether the court might consider these curriculum laws to be government speech regulations. After all, when teachers are teaching students in primary and secondary schools, they might be speaking pursuant to their official duties. Indeed, they are. 
Uh, in Garcetti, the court expressly declines to decide this matter, and the circuits are now split on it, so we don't know for sure yet. Uh, so it's very unclear whether and how Garcetti's exception for what it calls speech related to scholarship and teaching would apply to teachers in primary and secondary schools as opposed to public colleges and universities. But in any event, that's why I'm here, because of my work on anti-gay curriculum laws. And in her book, Professor Norton often uses these laws to illustrate how the government speech can violate the Equal Protection Clause even when or though it cannot violate the free speech clause. In particular, she focuses on two examples, uh, the anti-gay curriculum laws of Texas and Alabama, which are basically identical. Under both laws, sex education courses must include, quote, an emphasis that, um, ironically, an emphasis from a public health perspective that homosexuality is not a lifestyle acceptable to the general public. It's a strange notion that you have to make a moral claim from a public health perspective. In addition, both laws require sex education to include, quote, an emphasis that homosexual conduct is a criminal offense under the laws of this state. As Professor Norton suggests, these laws mandate government speech, speech that I do think violates the Equal Protection Clause. By affirmatively requiring teachers to tell students that same-sex intimacy is unacceptable and criminal, um, in, in some sense falsely, um, they deny lesbian and gay students the opportunity to learn about who they are. They inflict dignitary harms on these students. Uh, and they, the laws themselves are motivated by nothing more than animus against them, obvious resonance with Bill's talk. Uh, but in this respect, the laws of Alabama and Texas are somewhat unusual. In most jurisdictions, anti-gay curriculum laws operate by prohibiting and restricting the discussion of homosexuality in schools rather than by affirmatively requiring. In 2017, when I published my article, 20 states had anti-gay curriculum laws by my count, but only four of them affirmatively required teachers to discuss homosexuality at all. This is why anti-gay curriculum law, uh, laws have been nicknamed no promo homo or don't say gay laws in the negative. For the most part, they mandate government silence rather than government speech. And I just wanna ask, does that make a difference in terms of whether they violate the Equal Protection Clause? I actually don't think it does. Um, and th there's a case in, out of Arizona that I think is relevant here. In 2010, the Arizona legislature passed a law banning public schools from offering courses in ethnic studies. When that law went into effect, it was enforced against only one program, Tucson's Mexican American Studies Program, which had been implemented to facilitate a desegregation in the school district. When teachers, students, and parents challenged the law, the district court found that it violated the Equal Protection Clause. To the best of my knowledge, that is the first federal court to ever invalidate a state curriculum law under the Equal Protection Clause. But note that Arizona's law did not mandate government speech. It only prohibited it. A similar pattern has appeared in constitutional challenges to anti-gay curriculum laws, although no court has had occasion to rule on this subject yet. When I was writing my article in 2016, I served on the legal team that filed Equality Utah versus Utah State Board of Education, which ended up being the first uh, successful challenge uh, to a state's anti-gay curriculum law. In our lawsuit, we challenged the constitutionality of Utah's no promo homo law, which forbade Utah public school teachers from engaging in what it called the advocacy of homosexuality, whatever that means. Much to our surprise, the Utah legislature uh, surrendered. They repealed the law by nearly unanimous margins only six months after we filed the lawsuit. Apparently, the Attorney General of Utah had walked into the leadership of the Senate and said, if we don't repeal this law, then I'm going to end up losing it and we're all going to end up paying the legal bills. In the years since, I've continued working with the National Center for Lesbian Rights and Lambda Legal to file similar claims in Arizona and South Carolina with similar results. In Arizona, the superintendent agreed to our with our claims the day we filed them, uh, and the legislature repealed the state's no promo homo law two weeks later. And in South Carolina, the attorney general issued an opinion agreeing with us even before we had filed our complaint. And within 13 days, we had entered into a consent decree in which the court and the defendants agreed that the law was unconstitutional. So over and over, states have recognized that anti-gay curriculum laws violate the Equal Protection Clause, regardless of whether they mandate the government's speech or the government's silence. It is no accident that anti-gay curriculum laws straddle this distinction between the government's speech and the government's silence. 
Discrimination against lesbian, gay, and bisexual people in particular has long taken the form of governmental silence. In Blackstone's commentaries, he refers to sodomy as, I'm gonna butcher the Latin pronunciation, uh, but it's uh, peccatum illud horrible, uh, inter Christianos non nominandum, which is uh, the dreadful sin not to be mentioned among Christians. The idea was that by speaking about sodomy, the authorities might somehow encourage it. This is an exceptionally old idea, but it hasn't been retired yet. Until the 1960s, most states prohibited sodomy, not by describing the conduct itself, but by referring to it only as, quote, the detestable and abominable crime against nature. In 1973, the US Supreme Court held that these laws were not unconstitutionally vague, even though they deliberately failed to mention, let alone describe the conduct that they were prohibiting. And to this very day, Mississippi still defines unnatural intercourse in precisely these medieval terms. But even in the years since Stonewall, governmental silence has been a prominent feature of discrimination against lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. As Professor Norton observes in her book, the Surgeon General's report on AIDS was a welcome and remarkable example of government speech, but it was preceded by a very long silence, which was not accidental. For five years, while thousands of gay men were dying of AIDS, the Reagan administration was explicitly and aggressively prohibiting and preventing the Surgeon General from discussing AIDS at all, and repeatedly, they would warn the press before they interviewed him, you, you may not ask him about AIDS. If you do, he's not allowed to answer those questions. In response, the LGBT movement launched the silence equals death campaign as a protest to the government's uh, inadequate response to the epidemic. In 1993, President Clinton signed Don't Ask, Don't Tell, a remarkably explicit example of the government's silence. Rather than banning gay people from serving in the US Armed Forces, the policy prohibited military recruiters from asking applicants if they were, quote, homosexual or bisexual, and also prohibited gay and bisexual soldiers from coming out. It was a comprehensive regime of silence, governmental silence about homosexuality, ordered by the commander in chief and sanctioned by Congress. So to paraphrase Professor Norton here, in the annals of LGBT history, examples of the government's silence do abound. And in light of that history, I think it becomes clear that silence is a primary way that the government discriminates against lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. So this begs this question, under what circumstances could the government's silence, as opposed to the government's speech, violate the Equal Protection Clause? Incidentally, it's already clear that the government's silence can violate other constitutional clauses. Brady is a classic example. When a prosecutor is aware of exculpatory evidence, they have an affirmative duty to disclose it. If they fail to discharge that duty, they violate the Due Process Clause. And there's a whole body of literature questioning whether there are constitutional limits on the executive's ability to keep secrets. So even though Professor Norton's book is about the government's speech, I think it supplies most of the principles we need to analyze the government's silence. Uh, because her framework is based on underlying theories of the Equal Protection Clause in that chapter, it works equally well for cases involving silence. So we can say the government's silence or speech violates the Equal Protection Clause for any one of three reasons. By denying certain groups equal choices and opportunities, inflicting dignitary or expressive harms, or just being motivated by nothing more than animus. And as she suggests, I think the laws of Alabama do and, and Texas do check all three of those boxes by denying LGBT students, well, at least, uh, at least lesbian, gay, and bisexual students, the same educational opportunities that other students are offered by sending the message that homosexuality is too immoral or shameful to discuss in schools, and because they're, the policies are motivated purely by animus. But I don't think that analysis is limited to the laws of Alabama and Texas, or even to those other provisions and other laws that affirmatively require teachers to convey anti-gay messages to students. I think the same principles apply with equal force to all anti-gay curriculum laws, even those best characterized as don't say gay or no promo homo laws. But there's an important wrinkle that comes up when the government is silent. Um, depending on the circumstances, the issue of state action may not be so clear. After all, the 14th Amendment only prohibits the states from denying equal protection of the laws. It does not prohibit the government from doing nothing, that is, from remaining silent. So when silence takes the form of government inaction, it might not trigger the 14th Amendment and therefore not the Equal Protection Clause. Not hard to imagine examples of this, uh, scenarios in which the government's failure to speak can be plausibly described as inaction rather than action. 
at any given moment, the government is not speaking about a potentially infinite range of subjects from veganism to string theory and beyond. And in most cases, it is simply not speaking about these issues without making a conscious choice not to address them. But as we can already tell, the history of discrimination against lesbian, gay, and bisexual people is a different matter. In this history, we see many examples in which the government makes a deliberate choice and takes affirmative steps to prohibit government officials from referring to homosexuality at all as a means of intentionally discriminating against lesbian, gay, uh, and bisexual people. From these examples, I suspect that we can deduce a simple principle of when the Equal Protection Clause uh, prohibits the government's silence. Whenever the government makes a deliberate choice and takes affirmative steps to prohibit its officials from talking about a specific class of persons, then it can be challenged and reviewed under the Equal Protection Clause, that, that decision. Uh, for equal protection purposes, the distinction between speech and silence I don't think is relevant here. So long as the state action requirement is satisfied, the government cannot deny any person equal protection of the laws, neither by its speech nor by its silence. I don't have time to cover this today, but there's uh, uh, two uh, things to add here briefly, which is one, the history of discrimination against transgender people is quite a different matter, which is yet a third relationship to this uh, distinction. Um, uh, discrimination, um, remedying discrimination against transgender people often depends on the person's ability to obtain government speech, documents recognizing the gender identity of the person, or indeed the use of pronouns, as we see in a recent Sixth Circuit case. Um, so I, I plan to go into that in the essay. The other thing is, on Wednesday, I got bad news. Arizona now is trying to find a new way to prevent teachers from talking about LGBT people and issues. On Wednesday, the House uh, representative passed a law that would require parental consent when any teacher wants to discuss sexuality, uh, gender identity, or gender expression in the classroom. They have to give prior notice and consent. Um, we don't know if, uh, if the Senate will pass it um, or the governor will sign it, um, and we're already talking about a legal challenge, but that's yet a third way that the government, um, uh, you know, through parental consent, um, it's similar to Bill's claim about endorsing private discriminatory views, um, and that's all I have. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, and um, so Alex uh, says it's, uh, it's up to you now. <laughs> Up to me. I got to start rolling now. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'm deeply grateful for, for Helen, for the many, many years of uh, friendship and uh, the many, many times I've learned from you, Helen, and uh, in this book and elsewhere. And thanks to the University of Illinois Law Review and to Dean uh, Vic Amar. I had uh, a special reason to be grateful for Helen's book. And that is that she kindly uh, placed it in my Cambridge Studies on Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. And now it's a, it's a gem uh, that uh, uh, she, she so kindly uh, uh, provided for all of us in the intellectual community. So I wanna speak about uh, something that I suppose in Mary Rose's uh, uh, characterization and Helen's I think would be first order uh, or that it, it uh, problems and uh, or maybe uh, it's something that they can they can help to edify me in. But I want to talk about how the establishment clause plays into government speech. So while the court has established that secular free speech falls outside the First Amendment, religious government messages are squarely prohibited by the establishment clause. Government as speaker adopts perspectives on matters as far flung as health, equality, safety, and education. But those views can neither favor nor disfavor religion. There are vehement disagreements about the wisdom of myriads of government programs, policies, statutes, priorities, and government is free to choose preferred viewpoint on similar subjects. Those, as the court has found, are normal and healthy manifestations of our democratic system of government. But political division along religious lines was one of the principal evils against which the First Amendment was intended to protect. This is not to deny that there is overlap between sacred and secular normative principles, but to argue that fusion of government speech with religious symbolism and doctrination and practice is an establishment clause violation. Hence, overtly religious government reliance on objectively religious contents and viewpoints, including prayers, nativity scenes, 
and religious symbols violate the First Amendment, no matter that associated secular meanings may also be connected to them. My symposium article will demonstrate the extent to which the Establishment Clause prohibits a public actor or agency from adopting religious messages and expressive symbols. Ultimately, the Lemon Test's entanglement prohibition, which has admittedly increasingly fallen out of favor with the court, most closely, closely resembles my suggested analytical method. The Establishment Clause, the article will argue, extends to official religious pronouncements, declarations, publications, symbolism, and monuments. Government speech that is objectively religious is constitutionally outside the realm of public functions. The constitution prohibits the state from focusing public messages with religious meanings. The limitation is explicitly stated in the opening clause of the first amendment, which restricts government from engaging in the private spheres of belief and ritual. One religious clause prohibits the government from participating in sectarian conduct, while the other requires government to respect personal autonomy. The government speech doctrine grants states the authority to explain religious ritual without actually participating in them, displaying of religious objects in a historical context, such as museums, and supporting the private enjoyment of religious beliefs of private citizens and public servants. The Establishment Clause restricts government from officially adopting religious messages that might signal sectarian preferences and favoritism. The First Amendment requirement that government remain neutral in pronouncements about matters of religious conviction helps to maintain a core component of counter-majoritarian, equalitarian, and pluralistic governance. That is, the balance between the Constitution's guarantee of individual conviction on the one hand and mandate of government excessive secularism exists on the other to preserve the fundamental right of dissent from state-imposed orthodoxy. Roberts Court's jurisprudence, on the other hand, has increasingly chipped away at the wall of separation. A majority of the court recently found that even a 32-foot cross maintained by local government at a busy street intersection did not overstep the constitutional limit of the establishment clause. Boy, I ran out of <coughs> air there. <clears throat> Despite the millennial pedigree of the cross as a preeminent Christian symbol, Elsewhere, the court found invocations at legislative sessions delivered by a chaplain to be generic religious and sectarian, even when the chaplain was appealing to a divinity. So too, the court upheld the government display of a crush, an explicitly religious holiday exhibit associated with the holiday of the epiphany to have neutral secular purpose when grouped with other non-religious objects. To me, it's a bit as if we put a church in a secular residential community and say, hey, it's no longer associated with religion. The difference here is that churches are protected by free exercise, association, and free speech rights. On the other hand, a nativity scene sponsored by public entity fuses religion with government's message, blurring the line or uh, uh, or a stat of a, the Establishment Clause separation. A modern person wearing a religious emblem hanging from a chain, such as just a public servant, an employee, or a private person, may regard it as no more than a fashionable ornament. It may be a statement of personal faith, nostalgia, aesthetics. However, no government entity can adopt religious symbolism into its communications and defend such actions by invoking only modern connotations. The establishment clause comes into play when the state entity fuses religious objects into its operation, messages, decrees, statutes, and other official pronouncements. Even when such symbols take on some more modern significance, religious objects remain semantically linked with their sectarian sources. Their use, display, and avowal in government speech signals preferences in a matter explicit, implicating the establishment clause principle of religious and secular separation. The establishment clause prohibits government speech that favors or disfavors and sincerely 
held religious belief. That clause preserves the equal right of citizens to worship or not, thereby empowering each to maintain individual sentiments on matters of faith while preventing government from showing preferences and adopting creeds into its official communiques, right? So in other words, the Establishment Clause and Free Speech and Free Exercise Clause work hand in hand to advance individual uh, religious practice. The first order question in a challenge to specific government symbols requires a judge to identify whether the challenged government speech is religiously motivated. If a matter of policy, government is free to express itself without First Amendment restriction. But the effect of the symbol is also critical, whether government takes on a religious object or simply speaks of it or respects free and independent worship. The court's inquiry should not be merely one of reasonably perceived endorsement, which would combine the elements of purpose and effect and from there would conjecture about the subjective perception of the average person. That's the O'Connor view, but should rather in uh, the query, uh, query further about whether the symbol has been fused into an official communication display or other statement. Further, the Establishment Clause stands against government adoption of religious dogma and symbolism. The government aims to prevent authoritative orthodox, the Constitution rather, aims to prevent authoritative orthodoxy and grants of official legitimacy on matters of private conscience. Statements, symbols, and rituals adopted in the name of a government entity take on the character of authority that imposes on believers and unbelievers a social reality that audiences may find inappropriate or even sacrilegious. Liturgy and icons take the place of public displays and thereby grant official sanction to religious reference with which only select members of the polity agree. The intent of government speaker to be inclusive cannot entirely shed the historical meaning of religious symbols like the cross, the star of David, the crescent and star, the ek enkor, the om. Neither can the perceptions of a presumed reasonable observer deliver, sac deliver sacral symbols from its sectarian roots. Their objective significance is fused with government ideology in official communications to the public. The objective features of religious messages are tied to ritual and sacerdotal meanings. They are understood by audiences irrespective of the subject reason, holiday, charity, or otherwise that the government actor attributes to them. In contrast with government speech that is prohibited because of its religious roots, Speech about religion is consistent with government's educational and cultural roles. And here I'm thinking about state university college literature courses, museum displays, national leaders interactions with religious constituents, police and fire services, and so on. That's speech about religion. How are you, uh, Father so-and-so? How are you, Rabbi so-and-so? That's speech about, that's not religious speech. A trend in recent Supreme Court precedents interpreting the Establishment Clause has been to uphold the fusion of religious messages into government statements by downplaying their religious significance. Cases in this area tend to favor free exercise principles without giving adequate weight to anti-establishment speech arguments. Several Establishment Clause opinions discount the religious meaning of the nativity scene with its manifest worship of the baby Jesus, which is closely connected with the message of God sending his only begotten son to save the world from original sin. If we move on to Augustine a little bit further than the gospel. The court's opinion in Lynch v. Donnelly, for example, plays down the crush's connection to the doctrine of Jesus's divinity and worship of him. The symbol is a statement of faith that should be outside the realm of government expression, irrespective of what symbols surround it. The court has been even less explanatory in relying on a historical practice as justification, which it has used to uphold the self-evidently religious practice of prayer prior to legislative sessions of state and municipal legislative sessions.
This runs counter to ordinary judicial analyses that strike historical practices when they violate constitutional norms. The court's willingness to ignore objective meaning of a historically religious symbol allows for fusing of governmental religious messages. For example, the majority in American Legion versus American Humanist Association concluded that the cross maintained by government funding did not encroach the Establishment Clause because it was no more than a World War I memorial for all fallen soldiers of the Great War, irrespective of their religion. To the contrary, the cross is no neutral symbol. The significance of its message is not the same to, for the Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, and atheists, showing favor only to the former. The cross has a singular religious message. Its referent is Christian dogma of resurrection and redemption. The court's overbroad interpretation of historical narratives tend to shift judicial opinions from the objectively religious content of legislative prayers, holiday displays, and memorial objects. In truth, no matter the context, these do not lose their religious meaning. They may indeed have secular connotations, but that does not alter the meanings attributed to them for millennia. The religious object of or invocation retains its significance even when incorporated into government displays. The freedom to adopt these objects is personal worship. In no way expands government's ability to fuse them into official messages, functions, and services. The meaning of religious symbols cannot be cleaved from the historical, scriptural, and sacral roots. Justice O'Connor pointed, pointedly explained a problem of overstating the importance of historical longevity alone. Analogously, past racial and gender discrimination does not immunize historical practices from scrutiny under the 14th Amendment. An earlier court had similarly asserted that no one acquires a vested or protected right of violation of the Constitution by long use, even when that span of time covers our entire national existence and indeed predates it. Pedigree is not synonymous with constitutionality. Where the, a court discounts the specific and objective meaning of a symbol, it fails in its interpretive function and leaves religious government speech intact. Government plays many parts in communicating, listening to, paying for, and refining messages. Its statements are generally at the discretion of policymakers unless they are constitutionally limited. Establishment clause prohibits government speech that sends a message to non-adherents that they are outsiders, not full members of the political community. The prohibition includes not only government endorsement, but also fusion with religious symbols, practices, and dogma. And I thank you so much for, for, for listening. Uh, thank you very much. And so now we will turn to questions in the same format as before. Please raise your virtual hand and uh, we'll try to get in as many uh, questions as, as possible. Um, so Helen, I get, uh, please get started. Thank you. Yeah, apologies for pushing to the front of, of the line. Um, you know, everyone should be so lucky in their in their life to have people think about your ideas so thoughtfully and so creatively. It's 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 astonishing. Um, uh, something for each of you. So uh, Mary Rose, thank you so much for thinking so creatively and energetically about what we can do to counter the government's destructive expression. And as you know, um, there are, I agree that there are all sorts of limits to constitutional enforcement, which I've been focusing on, but, but not exclusively. Uh, and so I, I, I again, I'm so grateful for you thinking through what else we might do. But at the same time, the reason I keep circling back to constitutional litigation is because I am more and more frustrated, as you point out, with the limits of democratic accountability, right? The limits of transparency. The fact that that's that's not turning out to be the panacea that it's it's theoretically supposed to be. So I guess I'm asking you to help me with my um, my 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 discouragement, right? I, I see the limits of constitutional litigation, but I also sadly see all sorts of limits uh, 
with democratic accountability. And so I'd be grateful for your help with that. Uh, Cliff, what an amazing project. This is gonna be such a contribution to government speech, to equal protection, to state action. Uh, I just so love this idea that um, silence as an expressive choice can and does inflict all sorts of harms and that deliberate silence could be understood as state action. And I guess I'd love to hear you riff a little bit about um, what other, I see implications for your ideas, not only in the context that you addressed with schools curriculum choices with respect to sexual orientation and gender identity, but I think it also has implications for the government's deliberate silences about um, public health issues, the government's deliberate sci uh, silences about science, uh, and those could have equal protection implications, they could have due process clause implications. Uh, you have plenty to write about already, but, but I just want to, I would love to hear you talk about that. And then finally, for both Bill and Alex, um, both of your remarks had me thinking about the same sort of thing. You know, the way I think about these issues is that the government does not have a right, government doesn't have a right to anything, right? The Constitution protects us from the government. Uh, and doesn't protect the government from us. So the government has no rights, including no First Amendment right to speak, but in Hofeldian terms, the government has a privilege, a privilege to speak. And I have a pretty expansive view of that privilege, but I think that privilege is checked independently by other constitutional provisions. So just as if the president has an Article II privilege to do something, we still have to stop and make sure that, that she's not violating the Equal Protection Clause or the Due Process Clause or the First Amendment. But I saw, both of you, I don't know if it was an alternative argument or an additional argument, sort of suggesting an ultra virus theory of government speech that sometimes even before we get to what I call second stage government speech problems, we should be asking whether or not government has any business to be talking about these sorts of things. And then I think I hear both of you saying in certain in certain contexts, the government has no, this is not a permissible government function, right, as a structural matter to be speaking with animus against protected class members or to be speaking on religious matters, which I, I think I see as a, a, as a separate uh, approach to thinking about government speech. And I just would love to hear you talk about whether or not you have accurately characterized part of your thinking. Well, thank you. Alex, let's, let's get your question in as well. Thank you. <laughs> Ask a question on my own panel. I, I love that. Thank you so much. Um, Bill, I, I, I really appreciate uh, so much your work here on finding speech that's beyond what is allowable, particularly using the animus perspective. And I noted particularly the Confederate battle flag point that you made, as you know, I make that point, but in the context of the 13th Amendment, and, and you, you're making it in the context of the Equal Protection Clause, but I think they could work hand in hand because maybe speech that's not legitimate. I mean, of course, you've got this very deep point about animus, which you do in, in so much of your, your work. Uh, but in addition to that, it may be things where what government's not allowed are things that are at least things that are specifically prohibited under the Constitution. Animus has got to be one of them from city of Cleburne, of course. I mean, that's the constitutional, that's the Judicial interpretation, but nevertheless, that's that's the constitutional interpretation, that meaning of equal protection. What I wonder, though, for uh, that in my question for you and also for uh, uh, Clifford, for Cliff, is how to enforce these things, right? How would one enforce such a right? Whether silence, government silence, is what is um, violative or whether or not animus statements of inequality are those that violate individuals' rights. How are these actionable? Again, going back to the question of standing, that, that for sure plays a role in, in it. Uh, great, um, and so this works out really well because uh, Bill, uh, Bill Ariza is first on our list as, uh, uh, as, uh, as respondent. Um, I'm gonna slip in a question as, as, as well, um, if you don't mind, Bill. Um, I wonder if as you're sort of thinking about uh, this issue of, of animus, this is also uh, something that goes to Clifford's uh, 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 paper. Um, one way of thinking about it is the government's uh, right to speak or, or not to speak, right? Um, the other way to think about it is from the perspective of the listener. And so you could reconceptualize your animus approach as the right of the listener not to 
hear um, messages that are offensive from the from the government. And I wonder whether uh, there might be uh, some room to play on on that end of of, of the scale. Um, so 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 Bill. Yeah. Okay. Great. So thank you all for these questions. Um, I'll just take them into order in which they were asked. So Helen, I have to think about the ultra virus versus second order point a little more carefully. Um, my first inclination is to say that it is, I'm not making a kind of a preliminary ultra virus point before getting to your second order uh, point. Um, because I think actually government has rights to speak even for purely expressive reasons. I mean, in terms of ultra virus, obviously it's not ultra virus to speak in pursuit of a regulatory program, even though maybe you know they can still it can still be struck down if, if it ends up being you know too harmful to equality interests. So that's that's an easy case. On the expressive point, I think government has a right to engage in expressive, uh, uh, what I'm calling purely expressive speech as well, i.e., non-regulatory speech. So I don't think it's an ultra virus point, but what I do think is that as a second order matter that uh, purely expressive speech, flying a flag, for example, be the canonical example, um, can in fact violate an independent constitutional prohibition as of course your book talks an awful lot about. So I think it's not an ultra virus argument, I don't think, although I would wanna make sure to think about that a little more carefully before being definitive. Um, Alex, in terms of the 13th Amendment, absolutely. And of course, you know, I know your work about the 13th Amendment, and I know that a lot of 13th Amendment scholars basically see that as the preferred vehicle for equality as opposed to the 14th. And so at the very least, I think we can agree that depending on what you think about the 13th Amendment, how broadly you read it, um, surely it would pick up this sort of speech without any difficulty. How to enforce it, I actually don't, maybe I'm misunderstanding, I don't see that as a big deal. Um, you just bring <laughs> you bring a lawsuit, uh, and of course, you know Helen's book talks about this. You know, in terms of, for example, Confederate flags, right? So African Americans have brought lawsuits. Um, now, those lawsuits have failed, and maybe that's what you're getting at. And there may, in fact, be litigation barriers or equal protection doctrine barriers, like disparate impact and sort of, you know, et cetera, kind of a Palmer B. Thompson problem. Maybe that's where the Fourteenth Amendment lawsuit approach sort of runs into a into a roadblock. But as a conceptual matter, I don't think it's particularly difficult. You simply bring a, I mean, not to be flip about it, you bring a lawsuit, you know, and you claim that this flying of the flag violates equal protection. And in fact, people have done that as Helen's book notes. Um, Jason, listeners rights not to hear. Yeah, no, I mean, um, I think that is a, you know, I think it's a fascinating conceptual point about the rights that listeners have under the uh, 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 under the First Amendment, presumably, or maybe under the Fourteenth Amendment. I'm not exactly sure where you would locate that right. Um, I just may maybe I'm this is just the standard you know hit on me. I'm not that you know I'm kind of plotting here. I just I just don't see the ease of making a listener's rights argument. Um, unless you're simply going to you know, categorize it or pigeonhole it as a straight up equality claim. So the African-American plaintiffs in these Confederate flag cases, they could just as easily have made a listener's rights argument. I have a right not to have to see that thing every day, but then they call it an equal protection argument rather than a first amendment argument. So maybe it's you know, a listener right, but then I think the question comes, becomes, you know, where do you pigeonhole? So I'll just leave it at that. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, Mary Rose. Great, um, I think I had, well, I won't say it's the easiest question, but um, I'll say that um, first, Helen, thank you for contributing what you did because I, I do wanna make sure I represent your views accurately in my piece. So um, I appreciate that there are real limits and I um, to the ability of uh, the accountability process to work or transparency to lead to accountability. Um, and I, I do share your concerns that this is, uh, you know, relying on that alone would be problematic, that relying on a more robust press is uh, problematic and civic education. I mean, there I'm not alone. I think you all know, you know, Justice O'Connor, many other people are working very hard, I think, with renewed enthusiasm after the January 6th attack. Uh, 
um, this need to protect our democracy. And I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a essential um, thing that we can no longer, if anyone ever did, take it for granted. So um, I was trying to tap into that as well to bring it to this um, discussion. Um, but, uh, but, I, but I agree, if you can get constitutional litigation, uh, also, you know, not just in people, um, you know, as Clifford was arguing and, and Alex, you know, bringing challenges to the government speech. I think my article is focusing on when the government is silencing people who are trying to speak, um, that, uh, that it would be a very good idea to beef up these doctrines. And so I, I would agree with you that uh, we should not abandon that fight um, as well. So thank you very much for your comment and question. Uh, great, and so we have five minutes left. Uh, so uh, Clifford and Alex, uh, responses, uh, if, if you wish. Sure, um, I'd be glad to. Thank you um, uh, uh, for uh, Helen for these questions um, uh, and, and others, um, Alex. Um, uh, again, the camera won't pick me up unless someone spotlights me. It's fine uh, either way, though. Um, it, it's funny. It, it was actually, um, I, I, first of all, I appreciate Helen's invitation to think about other contexts. Interestingly, the narrative I told actually does include a public health uh, example, right? The Surgeon General, uh, I mean, a pandemic, no less, uh, an epidemic um, uh, of a contagious disease. Um, and I, it's easy to imagine others. Um, you could imagine... Uh, a surgeon general or someone of that kind uh, refusing to discuss a particular disease because of its prevalence in a particular community, right? Um, or refusing to discuss if the government um, uh, either affirmatively prohibiting the discussion of or refusing to um, discuss, uh, you know, uh, some uh, sort of sad discriminatory chapter related to public health, like the Tuskegee experiments or something like that. If you imagine banning the discussion of that in some context. Um, or, uh, you know, not wanting to talk about abortion um, uh, in schools or in, in other contexts or contraceptives. Um, uh, typically, uh, the easiest cases are going to be ones where the subject matter to be discussed has a very tight relationship to what the court calls a politically unpopular group, right? That's going to be um, a, the clearest equal protection trigger. Um, uh, and I think, um, you know, my response uh, to Alex's question, it, it was almost verbatim. I was thinking of the things that Bill said, which is you bring a lawsuit. I, what I take you uh, to be asking is really a question about standing. And you, of course, have to show harm and injury. And I'll just give you an example of how I handled it in this context, which can be extrapolated from. I mean, uh, the most obvious um, group harm by a law that says you can't talk about homosexuality in public schools is lesbian, gay, and bisexual students. Um, there are, you know... Other students have the right to learn about the relationships in which they will enter, um, about their own desires, um, about the risks of uh, sexual behavior, uh, and lesbian and gay uh, and bisexual students are denied that right quite specifically. Also, the children of lesbian, gay, and bisexual parents, there's a message being sent that their parents are engaged in a relationship that is just too shameful to discuss in schools, um, uh, you know, a relationship that they would probably like to learn about um, as students. The question of teachers is, and this gets to Jason's question, it's much more complicated because now we have a government speech issue. Um, can they raise an equal protection claim? If they're lesbian, gay, bisexual teachers, it's probably the easiest way to make that claim because uh, they're often prohibited from coming out to students under these laws because that's the advocacy or promotion of homosexuality. Um, but what about just the teacher who wants to talk about homosexuality is that, and then we get to the listener's right to know and all that stuff, but we just have a lot of, uh, because of the government speech doctrine, we have a lot of barriers to that kind of, we, we made a free speech claim in my, our lawsuit, but uh, we did not include it um, in our initial motion practice for this reason. Um, uh, and in subsequent lawsuits, the lawyers have persuaded me at least that free speech can be left out of the equation and we just bring the equal protection claim. Uh, so I hope that's helpful. Uh, thank you all. And Alex, you have one minute. Yeah, and I, I, that's all I need. Uh, so what I was trying to say, and I'm, I'd be curious and different when we have more time to talk, uh, Mary Rosen and, and Helen, is that I take this to be what, what Helen calls second stage problem in her book. That is to say, when a government speech infringes, infringes on a specific constitutional right, and here I'm tying in the free exercise clause and the establishment clause, and that, that an establishment clause violation is a violation of free exercise because it creates a government orthodoxy and, uh, and 
it's a cognizable harm that's actually a, what in exactly in Helen's words, constitutional right. I mean, it's a specific constitutional principle about the function of government and its um, uh, and the requirement that it uh, not uh, not fuse, not adopt any uh, religious orthodoxy in order for people of all sorts of faiths to feel free to uh, exercise their autonomous right to uh, religion or non-religion. Perfect. Um, okay, so we have a, a 10 minute uh, break and then we will reconvene for the final panel. And uh, thank you so much for these, uh, again, excellent set of papers, really wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so uh, welcome back for our final hour. And uh, we're going to begin with uh, Erwin Chemerinsky. And I see Erwin that you're here. Um, uh, greetings to you. Um, uh, just a reminder, uh, 15 minutes maximum, please. And I will give you a 12 minute warning and then um, uh, another warning at 15 uh, minutes. But uh, Erwin, uh, over to you. Thank you so much. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be part of this wonderful conference. I only wish we could all be together in person. I wanna speak this morning about free speech dead zones. These are places where the First Amendment doesn't apply at all, or at least hardly applies. I wanna suggest that this is undesirable because it exempts speech from any form of constitutional scrutiny. I think it gives the government far too much latitude to regulate speech, often very important speech. Everyone on this call is familiar with the usual framework for free speech. Content-based restrictions get strict scrutiny. Content neutral get intermediate scrutiny. The categories of unprotected speech like incitement and obscenity and child pornography. But what I wanna talk about is areas 
where the Supreme Court has either effectively or explicitly walled off the speech from constitutional scrutiny. Let me give you several examples of what I mean here. And again, they're familiar to everyone. First example I would give is the speech of government employees on the job and the scope of their duties. Everyone at this symposium is familiar with Garcetti versus Sabalas. I think it is one of the worst free speech cases from the Roberts Court, one of the worst in recent memory. There the Supreme Court said, there is no First Amendment protection for the speech of government employees on the job in the scope of their duties. This then means there's no constitutional protection for whistleblowers for reporting misconduct. Many years ago, I did a study of the Los Angeles Police Department after the Rampart scandal. I interviewed almost 100 police officers. I was convinced that dealing with the problem of access of force and police abuse above all required some form of whistleblower protection where officers could come forward and report misconduct by other officers without facing discipline. Garcetti versus Sabalas makes that impossible. Now, it doesn't have to be a free speech dead zone for speech by government employees that's off the job. It's not as if there's absolute First Amendment protection. In fact, the Pickering balancing test that we're all familiar with still gives the government a great latitude to regulate speech. So we know under Pickering, speech is protected only if it's a matter of public concern, only if on balance it's desirable to protect it. But I think that standard, which I would regard as still not speech protected enough, is still much better than creating a free speech dead zone. Or a second example that I would point to, which is focus of a lot of discussion today, is the government speech doctrine. That once it's deemed that it's government speech, then the First Amendment doesn't apply at all. It really does create the equivalent of a dead zone. I think that the government speech doctrine at times seems innocuous. Pleasant Grove versus Summa initially seems innocuous. The government is putting monuments in the park. The government is the speaker. Shouldn't the government be able to express a message? For examples that Justice Breyer has given, he says, shouldn't the government be able to express a message against smoking or in favor of recycling? But as the government speech doctrine has developed, it seems to me much more insidious and the potential free speech dead zone grows. I very much disagree with Texas Division of Sons of Confederate Veterans versus Walker. Again, everyone here is familiar with it. I think the key is that Texas would allow not-for-profit groups to have a message put on license plates. I think in this way, Texas was creating a forum for private speech. But the Supreme Court said that the license plates are a form of government identification and therefore it's government speech. To me, there's two ways of framing the issue. Do we frame it as the government is creating a forum for expression so that then the First Amendment applies? Or do we put this in the category of government speech and it becomes a free speech dead zone? I would certainly want the presumption to always be in favor of the former. I think in this case, it clearly is. My concern about the government speech dead zone is its ability to swallow so much else of First Amendment doctrine. In Pleasant Grove versus Summum, the Supreme Court made clear that the government can speak by adopting private speech as its own. But if so, then there seems no limit on the ability of the government speech doctrine to preclude constitutional protection for expression. Imagine that a city has an ordinance that it's not going to allow any demonstrations in a particular city park. But then it allows, I'll make it a pro-Trump demonstration in the city park. And it says, well, we're adopting that private demonstration as our speech. And since it's our speech, government speech, the First Amendment doesn't apply. Blatant viewpoint discrimination that would otherwise be unacceptable becomes permissible just by the government adopting it and calling it government speech. Now that may seem far-fetched until you think back to Rust versus Sullivan. Rust versus Sullivan, of course, 
was the government conditioning money on doctors not being able to make abortion referrals. I would have thought that that's clearly an unconstitutional condition imposed by the government with regard to its funding. But by characterizing it as government speech, the First Amendment doesn't apply. A doctor advising a patient is in no way government speech. In fact, what the government was trying to do was prevent that speech because it didn't want that particular message being heard. Isn't this the government speech doctrine becoming a dead zone that very much prevents expression? Let me give a third example that may not be a complete dead zone, but practically being comes close. And that's the secondary effects doctrine. We all know the basic rule that content-based restrictions on speech have to meet strict scrutiny. I've thought that one of the most inexplicable cases, one of the hardest to teach my students is City of Renton versus Playtime Theaters. There, a city is engaged in clear content-based restriction saying that all the adult entertainment has to be in one corner of the city. Now, the court might have upheld that following other decisions that basically treat, treat sexual speech as low value speech. But that's not what the court did. The court said there's secondary effects and based on the need to combat the secondary effects, the government is able to regulate the speech. It's not content-based restriction. But there are always secondary effects to speech. Never is the court articulated any principles as to which secondary effects trigger the secondary effects doctrine and which don't. By calling something a focus on secondary effects, the court effectively creates a free speech dead zone. If you compare the cases where the courts rejected the secondary effects doctrine, like Discovery Network versus City Cincinnati, Booth versus Berry, with City of Renton versus Playtime Theaters, doctrinally, it's hard to define when does the secondary effects doctrine apply? But we know once it does, then the government can engage in content-based restrictions. Then it's in essence a First Amendment dead zone. Let me give a fourth and final example that I think is very close to a First Amendment dead zone. And that's when the government makes claims with regard to military or national security. And the unwillingness of the court to apply the usual First Amendment principles and the deference that's given to the government which allows me to say, this is very close to a First Amendment dead zone. Again, I can give examples that are familiar to you. Take Humanitarian Law Project versus Holder from a little bit over a decade ago. This would seem to me a case that had to be analyzed under the Brandenburg test. The question is whether or not this expression, which was charged with giving material support for terrorist activities, was sufficient to meet the test for incitement. But nowhere does Chief Justice Roberts' majority opinion mention the Brandenburg test. And instead, it's just about expression to the government with regard to issues of national security. Or take Fair versus Rumsfeld as an example. The challenge to the Solomon Amendment that required that law schools allow military recruiters be on campus. And I should disclose here, I was one of the plaintiffs in Fair versus Rumsfeld and involved in litigation from the very beginning. I think this clearly was compelled speech. Law schools were required to post notices. This was compelled association. Those are the reasons the Third Circuit declared this unconstitutional. But if you go back to Chief Justice Roberts' majority opinion, it's quite explicit in saying that since this is about the military, great deference has to be given and I don't think the usual rules of constitutional law, First Amendment were applied at all. Or think of speech on military bases. There's Greer versus Spock. There's a case that I argued in the Supreme Court a few years ago and lost unanimously, United States versus Appel, or the speech of military personnel, Brown versus Glein, or in the national security context, the SNAP case, in terms of the ability of the government to engage in prior restraints. In preparing for this talk and in preparing for the paper, I was trying to think of First Amendment cases where the Supreme Court has rejected military or national security arguments. I can think of only one, the Pentagon Papers case 
New York Times versus United States. So while this isn't entirely a free speech dead zone, it certainly comes close. What I wanna do by bringing these examples together is criticize the very notion of a free speech dead zone. At the very least, it gives the courts too much discretion based on the framework they use, how they characterize the matter. If the government employee's speech is seen on the job, then no First Amendment protection. If it's off the job, well, there's some First Amendment protection. In the world of social media, in the world of remote access, is this distinction one that makes sense? And doesn't a lot just depend on characterization? Or as I said, with regard to the government speech doctrine, if it's thought as the government creating a forum for private speech, First Amendment rules, if the court says it's the government is the speaker, it's a First Amendment dead zone. Or with regard to the secondary effects doctrine, the point I was trying to make is the court has so much discretion as to whether to say, well, these secondary effects mean that the doctrine applies. The usual rules with regard to content-based restrictions are inapplicable. And of course, if the matter is characterized military national security, it's if there's an exception to the First Amendment at all. And this kind of ability to manipulate the doctrines, I think, undermines what we're trying to achieve with any set of doctrines in constitutional law, and certainly the First Amendment. But I would go further and say that there should always be First Amendment scrutiny of government regulation of speech. Perhaps there are areas where there's going to be more deference, but the idea of First Amendment dead zones creates judicial abdication with regard to speech. And it's that judicial abdication that I especially want to criticize. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. And again, thank you so much for including me in this wonderful symposium. Uh, thanks so much, Erwin. And uh, next we are going to hear from Jacob Eisler. Oh, we can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. And uh, in particular, I'd, I'd like to uh, extend my thanks to Helen. I, I found her book fantastic. Um, and as you'll see today, uh, I build in particular on some of her ideas from chapter six. Um, I'd also like to thank the other contributors, um, who, you know, the, and uh, the, the arrangement of the, of, the, of the conference is great. Um, uh, Professor Chemerinsky talked about um, dead zones. I'm going to be talking about a blind spot and a particular solution to it. So it's so, a so beautiful transition, I think. Um, and finally, I'd like to extend my, my thanks to um, Catherine Youngley for their, uh, their hard work on um, putting the conference together. And I, I look forward to the entire issue. So um, I do have a, a brief PowerPoint. Uh, let me see if I can get this to work. All right, are we good? To, is everyone, is, are we good? Okay, great. Okay, so um, this uh, presentation is meant to deal with um, a particular problem in the context of um, state speech. And uh, that is the fact that the First Amendment does not regulate uh, state speech. In particular, it, um, the viewpoint neutrality does not apply to state speech. And this is, this is well established. Um, two of the cases that have been discussed, uh, I think uh, most continuously today, uh, Walker and Sumum are the foundational cases for this. When, and, uh, when the government speaks, it is not barred by the free speech clause from determining the content of what it says. The government does not need to adhere to viewpoint neutrality when it speaks. Um, now, uh, uh, one of these sort of presentational paradoxes, I actually think the most interesting uh, language here is, is the language I've put in the smaller font there. This is ultimately a democratic justification. I'll return to this, this idea that it should be uh, the state that reflects the will of the people. This should be part of a, a broader democratic discourse. I think that raises an interesting paradox in the current political circumstances. But the fact that um, state speech is not expected to adhere to these constitutional requirements creates um, a blind spot. Government speech isn't expected to adhere to uh, viewpoint neutrality. Um, and uh, the law seems to be that uh, other than the establishment clause, 
the government may speak as it wishes. And it seems as though the current state of the law is the, the, the primary uh, limitation on government speech is democratic process, either laws that are um, passed uh, through the legislative process. And um, uh, Professor uh, Norton speaks about these uh, quite a, quite a bit with 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 a great deal with a great deal of thoughtfulness in in her book, um, and she discusses some of the ways how the, this this legislation isn't particularly forceful. Um, but again, if we look to uh, the the rhetoric of the court, it really suggests the primary limitation on government speech should be the democratic process itself; that it should be the people who should control the government. Um, but I'll, I'll try and move through this as, uh, as, as as quickly as I can. I know it's late in the day. We've all heard uh, a great deal about some of the recent political crises. Um, we've seen a period in American history, um, and while there, there there might be some alleviation of it, um, it there's still certainly a great deal of polarization. The the the, the, the crisis is is still ongoing, where we have um, speech made by state actors that seems particularly uh, destructive or discriminatory or um, as I'll get to in a bit, highly partisan, aimed to achieve uh, partisan outcomes. And Trump's speech uh, presents many examples of this. Um, his, his, his conduct on January 6th is arguably uh, the most vivid example uh, where he seemed to suggest that his supporters should overturn an uncontested um, democratic process. And I know um, Professor Tori Spilisi is going to uh, speak more about um, some, of the, some of the content of the claims that Trump makes. But more generally, his speech reflects um, the quality of uh, using his political position to potentially attack vulnerable groups and to achieve his own ends. Now, because of the current state of the uh, Supreme Court interpretation of the First Amendment, he's not held uh, constitutionally accountable for this. Ultimately, it is the people who are supposed to police him. But if he is using his position of democratically granted authority precisely to challenge the outcomes of the democratic process in particular, and perhaps in, in somewhat more uh, indirect and subtle ways, not subtle in terms of the rhetoric, but subtle in terms of how that undermine democracy. He is um, attacking uh, the legitimacy of democratic process. How can this work? What is the um, solution to the fact that some, some governmental figures may abuse their um, democratically authorized power um, to engage in speech that is itself anti-democratic or damaging to um, democracy? Well, one option we have, and I would say that um, I think Trump's speech on January 6th comes close to the line, even under um, Brandenburg of, of, of speech versus action, right? Um, that can be debated, but that's not necessarily the avenue I want to explore today. But one option is to selectively reclassify speech as um, action. The, there are risks here, though, right? Some of them are purely doctrinal. Um, the law has positionally adopted an expansive conception of speech. It's also not a conceptually clear line. And there's, there's, there's a great deal of work both in law, Fred Schauer has written about this, about the, the, the fragility of the, um, of the uh, speech act distinction. And in political theory, um, Quentin Skinner has written about this extensively about how yes, all speech comprises an act, all right? So this is even trying to turn to this line to address this problem may not be um, especially satisfying. But ultimately, the reason I, I think that um, attempting to use reclassification of some government speech um, as action merely because we um, it, it is traditionally speech-like but seems threatening is that it relies on formalism instead of turning to the underlying substantive principle to resolve um, the problem. So I'd like to propose uh, a new way of thinking about how the First Amendment should apply to government speech. And this involves returning to the uh, normative underpinnings of the First Amendment, particularly in the political context. The First Amendment is seen as a mechanism by which citizens use their autonomy and reason to scrutinize the government and reach good political outcomes. However, 
for this to be an effective deployment of the First Amendment, citizens can't be dominated by an outside influence. Again, more, um, more sort of tones of civic republicanism. But the citizens, the, the franchise, must be the ultimate source of, 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 of political outcomes. If it's dominated by any outside source, it's not the spirit of the First Amendment is undermined. This source of domination could include the state itself. And I think this shows the potential weakness, particularly with regards to political speech of the current, um, the current jurisprudence on um, the exemption of government speech from constitutional scrutiny. Where the state becomes determinative of, this, of the reasoning of rank and file citizens who are supposed to be the ultimate source of political authority and to whom the government is accountable. We run the risk of the same types of domination that justify rights protection, even under the most classical understanding of the constitution. And this suggests that maybe this speech should deserve constitutional scrutiny. This is a, a high level argument and I'll turn to an application in a second. But the ultimate test is, does government speech run the risk of dominating the reasoning and political autonomy of citizens? Now, um, Michael and I in particular have been working on how um, government speech that has a partisan quality um, should perhaps uh, be subject to um, uh, greater scrutiny. And uh, this is, I think, what we see as particularly alarming about some of Trump's conduct. He is attempting to use his, his, his opportunity to speak as a government actor to achieve a highly partisan end. It serves his interests. And note how this weakens uh, the appeal of the court to democratic control. If Trump is exploiting his democratically authorized position to push a partisan agenda that would result in him retaining power, the very logic of um, uh, the First Amendment is potentially undermined, right? Because um, citizens are potentially having their capacity to use reason and sort through truth, um, sabotaged by the very entity which they should exert power over. And it is the, the sort of soundness of this relationship that the argument is in Walker is premised upon. Now, um, Michael has done uh, some, 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 some great work on um, how there is a constitutional norm against government partisanship, and in particular, look at the First Amendment context. Now, um, the core case of this establishes that um, the state may not uh, punish employees who engage in partisan speech. They, they, they enjoy a, a right of partisan neutrality in their political lives. The state may not punish them for the partisanship. This is a conceptual extension of it, suggesting that the government should not use partisan speech to potentially sabotage the autonomy of citizens. In some way, it's a conceptually um, creative extension. But I would say that the case for it is arguably even more compelling because the interest is so strong. This is about retaining the, the, the intrinsic validity of the purpose of the First Amendment. Now, um, I'm just going to wind up, uh, and this links with some of the discussions we've had and some of the interests that Professor Norton has expressed in actually litigating this, about how this, this, this theoretical ideal of non-domination could potentially introduce into the case law. Um, in, in, we were all familiar with Janice V, um, and I'm gonna try and pronounce this correctly, asks me, um, in which uh, the uh, idea of compelled speech was used to essentially, uh, uh, nullify union rights. Being required to um, join a union was a form of compelled speech. Right? What's particularly interesting about Janus is that it traces its case law lineage back to um, a case, Abood, that was, um, that, that was overturned in Janus. Abood informed um, uh, Johansby livestock markets which in turn is the foundation for Walker and Pleasant Grove. This suggests to me, and I'm, I'm still in the early stages of this, this suggests to me there might be the case for making an argument to um, the current court 
that a non-domination principle is intrinsic within the First Amendment, and that perhaps there is some potential here. If the court is hostile to compelled speech, it should be hostile to government um, to government use of uh, of its authority to speak in a partisan way. This is essentially um, compelling the people to speak because the government speaks because of its authorization by the rank and file voters. If it is using that power to in fact um, turn back to the rank and file voters and attempt to manipulate them or push them in a particular political direction, this is an even more alarming type of compelled speech. Now, I think that's the most interesting point. So um, that is uh, where I will pause the presentation and um, I'll just say thank you and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and so our, our final speaker um, is um, uh, Ciara torres Spilisi uh, from Stetson University College of Law. Good afternoon. Uh, let me get my PowerPoint up. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chara Torres Spellacy. I'm going to talk about the Supreme Court, the big lie, and voting rights limitations. But let me start here. This is a picture of my father. Uh, he was an artist and a very creative thinker. And when I was a youngster, he would tell me, Chara, remember to ask the big questions. Uh, the big question that I've been working on professionally for about a decade now is what is the proper role of corporate money in a democracy? Uh, this is the subject of my first book, Corporate Citizen, and uh, it's the topic of my second book, Political Brands. So in Political Brands, I uh, tackle the problem of branding overtaking truth in our elections. And I talk about different aspects of American political life that are getting rebranded, whether it's treason or greed or corruption or tragedy or truth. So a uh, big question for today's presentation, how did the Supreme Court facilitate the big lie and what is the fallout? Uh, so the Supreme Court, of course, sets the ground rules for our elections. And if we're worried about lying, we could ask the question, well, what has the Supreme Court said about lying? Are there any cases on point? And indeed there are. Uh, so this is the Susan B. Anthony list. It is an anti-choice, anti-abortion group. Uh, a couple years back, they ran ads like this, uh, accusing Congressman Steve Dryhouse of voting for taxpayer funded abortions. <clears throat> the only problem with this is that they were lying. Uh, and when they made this particular lie, they ran afoul of a then extant Ohio statute, which made it a crime to lie about the voting record of a public official. And so when the Susan B. Anthony list uh, gets in trouble for this, they raise the defense that they have a First Amendment right to lie. And they argue this all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, in the case, the Supreme Court isn't actually looking at the merits of the law. Rather, they are looking at the procedural question of whether the Susan B. Anthony list can raise this type of First Amendment defense. The Supreme Court says that they can, and then lower courts later invalidate the Ohio statute as violating the First Amendment. This is the Congressional Medal of Honor. This is Xavier Alvarez. And while I think a lot of us think of this guy as just a knucklehead, he was an elected official. Uh, and he claimed that he had won the Congressional Medal of Honor. And the only problem with this is that he was lying. And when he committed this particular lie, he ran afoul of the then extant Stolen Valor Act, a federal statute, which made it a crime to lie about military honors, including this type of honor. Uh, and Alvarez raised a defense very similar to the Susan B. Anthony list that uh, he had a First Amendment right to lie. And he took this all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court actually did get to the merits of this case. Uh, and the Supreme Court 
sides with the liar Alvarez that he does have a First Amendment right to lie. Uh, so that's what they've said about lying. What has the Supreme Court said about corruption? They've said a lot, especially recently. So the Roberts Supreme Court has narrowed the definition of corruption, both in campaign finance cases and in white collar crime cases. And I'm going to go over both really quickly. So one of the ways you can tell the difference that the Roberts Supreme Court has made compared to the Rehnquist Supreme Court is by looking at the language that they use. So if you look at the Rehnquist Supreme Court in cases like McConnell, uh, they have a very broad view of corruption. Uh, you can also see it in a case like Nixon where the Supreme Court, the Rehnquist Supreme Court says that corruption is a subversion of the political process, which is a very capacious way of thinking about corruption. Now, by contrast, in the Roberts Supreme Court, they have a very narrow view of corruption. Uh, and you can tell that from the language that they use in cases like Citizens United, where they seem to not care about corruption at all. Um, or in uh, McCutcheon, where they reduce corruption to merely quid pro quo exchanges. So that was in campaign finance. Let's switch over to white collar crime for a moment. So this is Jeff Skilling. He ran a corporation called Enron fraudulently. And as a result, he is hit with an enormous amount of jail time, 24 years in his original sentence. Now he appeals his conviction all the way to the Supreme Court. And while the court didn't buy every strange theory he was selling, they did agree with him in this aspect. They agreed that Skilling should not have been convicted of honest services fraud that required a kickback or a bribe, as in it required a quid pro quo. And because of this win at the Supreme Court, 10 years are shaved off of his 24 year sentence and Mr. Skilling is now a free man. This is Governor Bob McDonald of Virginia. This is his Rolex watch. Uh, the governor did not buy the watch for himself. Rather, it was purchased by this businessman named Johnny Williams. So Johnny Williams wanted to sell tobacco-based pills to employees of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so the governor set up meetings where the businessman could sell his wares. Then <laughs> the uh, governor is arrested and uh, convicted for various corruption crimes. He appeals his convictions up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court buys uh, Governor McDonald's argument that he didn't do anything wrong. It was just setting up meetings. Uh, and so the court agrees with him that just setting up meetings is something that he would do for any constituent, uh, not just one who had paid for his daughter's wedding. Uh, and as a result of this, there's no quid pro quo and Mr. McDonald never sees the inside of a jail cell. And just last year, this is Bridget Ann Kelly. Uh, she once closed the lanes of the George Washington Bridge uh, and she claimed that it was for a traffic study. The only problem with this claim is that she was lying. Uh, it was about political retribution for the mayor of Fort Lee. Uh, and she gets uh, convicted for essentially using this public bridge for a private purpose, basically this political retribution. Uh, and she appeals her conviction all the way to the Supreme Court. And just last year, the Supreme Court in Kelly versus US said not every corrupt act by a state or local official is a federal crime. So that's the legal background of the 2020 election. Let's talk about the 2020 election for a moment. Uh, so the 2020 election was remarkable in part because it took place during a pandemic. And that meant that more Americans by the millions would vote by mail. And uh, I was part of a group of scholars who put out a warning in early 2020, begging states to open their mail in ballots early because we could see a problem a mile away. And this was the problem. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as the blue shift and other times it's re referred to as the red mirage. It's the same problem. Basically, if you have Republicans voting by uh, in person and you have Democrats voting by mail, it's easier and quicker to process the in-person Republican votes. So you're going to have a vote total initially that looks like Republican candidates have won. But that is misleading because you haven't counted all of the ballots. And once you count all of the ballots, including the mail-in ballots, it is quite possible that 
the Democrat will have won. And so it'll look like a election or possibly many elections have flipped because of this counting phenomenon. And indeed, this, indeed, this happened. So early in the morning after uh, election day, Trump sees that he's ahead and he decides to claim victory, even though he knows that all of the votes are not accounted for yet. And he continues with this, he gets on Twitter, he uses every available means to perpetuate this big lie that he had really been the victor in this election. And one of the things I'm gonna to have to contend with in my paper is was the big lie government speech? Um, there's language in uh, first uh, in, in night where the, the court indicates that the president's tweets can be accurately described as government speech. Um, though there is this uh, warning from the court that the government speech do doctrine is susceptible to dangerous misuse. And I am so sad that the Supreme Court is ducking this case. I would have loved to have seen what the court would have done with the Twitter blocking by Trump. Um, but back to the big lie. So even as state after state certifies their election, Trump sticks to the big lie that he was the true winner. And most damagingly, on January 6th, he tells this to a live crowd in front of the White House. And some of that loud crowd um, then goes to the Capitol and delays the counting of the Electoral College votes for several hours. And this also re resulted in deadly violence. Now, I don't expect Trump to ever face consequences for the big lie. Uh, I think because of what the Supreme Court has done in this area of law, they've define corruption way too narrowly and they've given lying way too much protection. But that is only one consequence of the big lie. The other consequence we are seeing play out in real time. And that is, um, this is some data from my good friends at the Brennan Center. They are tracking over 350 bills that are restricting voting right now. And these are the states where they see these troubling pieces of legislation moving. And so the big lie is now being used as a justification for voting restriction, even though it is, you know, it's fanciful that uh, there was fraud in this election or that there was a big problem in this election. And yet this is being used to justify very new restrictive voting legislation. And so I wanna leave you with this horrifying tweet that I saw earlier today, which indicates that around 80% of Republicans do not think that the current occupant of the White House was rightfully elected. This is, a, this is like <laughs> the end of democracy in my mind. This is hor horrifying. Um, and so if you'd like to hear more about this, I, I talked with Dolly Lithwick about this uh, about a week ago. And there's also a episode on Netflix um, called Can You Buy an Election, where I, I talk about corporate money and politics more generally. So thank you. I look forward to the questions and conversations. Great, so thank you so much. Uh, we have about 15 minutes, so uh, uh, back to our usual format, please just raise your virtual hand if you have uh, a question and uh, I'll try to get to as many of you as possible. Uh, and uh, look at Mary Roche is right off the bat with her question, so we'll go to her. Well, I have been waiting because I, um, I just loved Irwin's presentation. I am glad someone agrees with me that Walker was badly decided. Um, and is a travesty. And I, I, Erwin, I wanted to ask you um, to talk a little bit more about what you'd like to see in place of what the court has done, um, mostly because uh, I would like an answer for myself. Um, you mentioned in your remarks a presumption that the government has created a form. And I thought that was, that was a very interesting idea. And I wonder if you could just spell that out a little bit more about how, what that would mean. Like what, once you have that presumption, what is there any way the government could overcome that presumption? What would that be? Um, uh, yeah, I'll just leave it there. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, so Helen, why don't you get your question on the table also um, while Erwin is mulling that, uh, uh, mulling his answer. Great, thank you. And, and I have a question for each of the terrific panelists. So Dean Chemerinsky, um, I think I and probably a bunch of people on the, on the call agree with you that Garcetti versus Ceballos is one of the court's worst First Amendment decisions ever. And I know you've done a lot of important litigation trying to get back to the court and to encourage it to cabin Garcetti in any of a variety of ways. So I, I'd be interested to hear you reflect on, on what you think the most important post Garcetti fight is in the court right now, what is most important to try to limit or clarify after Garcetti. Uh, Jacob, thank you so much. What an interesting idea this, uh, the domination principle is. I, I really wanna, I enjoy thinking about that. And I would like a little bit more um, clarity about conceptual principles and limiting principles. So I, I would be grateful if you would help me understand how domination differs from and relates to coercion or compulsion. And we can think of all sorts of speech that we consider to be coercive, like threats, right? Or speech by law enforcement to those in custody or to other captive audiences that really can't escape or protect themselves. And I understand that's not what you're talking here with respect to domination, but if you could offer a, a little bit um, more about how we know domination when we see it, that would be great. Um, and then Shara, finally, thank you so much. Uh, I'm inter you, sir, I understood the, the tail end of your remarks to be, among other things, trying to inspire us to take democratic political action to resist all of the uh, legislation pending that's proposing to roll back um, voting rights. I wonder if you could also talk a little bit about what you see as important existing legal or constitutional constraints on the government's lies of the sorts that you identify. I understand you did to say that some of them could be covered by current anti-fraud or anti-corruption statutes so long as the courts would interpret the statutes in those ways. Um, and I also wonder if there's an argument that at least some of these lies by government officials that have the intent or the effect of suppressing voting, for example, don't vote by mail, mailboxes are covered in COVID, find another 10,000 votes might be constrained uh, by the due process clause or some other constitutional provision. And Bill, uh, why don't you get your question out also? Thanks. Um, this actually dovetails nicely, I think, with Helen's last question is, is for Kiara as well. Uh, and it's really the same question that Helen asked of, uh, of Erwin, which is, um, what in your world would be different um, in terms of lies and how lies are regulated, um, especially given that the democratic process is often thought of as a fundamental ultimate check on lies by politicians? Okay, so over to you, Erwin. Sure. Let me deal with the two questions. First, Marie Rose's question. I think it's a great question. Um, I think, obviously, the government needs to be able to have the message to discourage smoking or to encourage recycling. It's expanding beyond that where I have real problems. So let me suggest three limits. First, the government can't speak by adopting private speech as its own. So that would get past my concern that the government can engage in viewpoint discrimination just by saying, we adopt this private speech as our speech. Second, the government can't speak by compelling others to deliver its message. So Rust versus Sullivan from this perspective was wrongly decided. And third, when it comes to drawing the distinction between whether it is a forum for speech or the government speech, there should be a presumption that it's a forum for speech rather than the government is the speaker. And I think to overcome that presumption really requires showing that the government itself is intentionally delivering a message in the particular instance. In terms of Helen's question, Garcetti versus Valles was 2006. We're now 15 years later and there's been no major Supreme Court case limiting it or clarifying it. There have been a number of cert petitions that have been denied. I did one a year ago, as you know, in the Warrenker case, when a man was fired for being superintendent of schools on account of speech that was clearly of public concern. So what are some of the ways of cabining it? Well, one is not applying Garcetti versus Sabalas to speech that's about academic freedom. The Ninth Circuit has already done that, just as Souter's opinion of Garcetti versus Sabalas suggests it. Second, I don't think Garcetti versus Sabala should apply where there's no civil service protection. Justice Kennedy's opinion in Garcetti stresses the availability of civil service remedies as an alternative. 
Well, when you're dealing with individuals for whom there's no other remedy, like a superintendent of schools that's fired for the speech, um, I think in those instances, Garcetti shouldn't be applied. Obviously, my idea would be that the Supreme Court overrule Garcetti and just apply the Pickering test, which is already, as I said, so deferential to the government. Uh, Erwin, I think you cut out for a second, but um, are you? Uh, did you finish your answer? Oh, I finished. I'm sorry. I had answered the two questions. I thought the third question was not directed at me. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. I apologize. No, no, no. Um, so, uh, Jacob, uh, over to you. Yeah, um, Helen, thank you so much. Um, so, uh, domination is, you know, is a very rich principle, and I, I, this is the beginning of, as I see it, the beginning of an inquiry, um, certainly uh, not the end. Um, Domination is merely the idea that a, that a, that a polity um, considered as a whole, and we in, in, in a liberal democracy would imagine this as um, the, the electorate or the franchise or the, or, 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 or the, the, the people not um, deciding their own course of political affairs. Um, domination exists when uh, that 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 polity is not autonomous in a liberal democracy because the um, the, the polity is identified with 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 the people when the people do not decide the course of um, governments. This is a very sociologically, um, and I think also uh, legal as we'll find, complex issue. And I think one of the most interesting places to look, um, maybe because I'm, I'm this one I'm most familiar with, is, is campaign finance. There's been, I think, a lot of um, conceptual either laziness on the side of the conservatives and tentativeness and vagueness on the side of the progressives in um, exploring what it actually means for a polity to be free. What's interesting in Walker is I think in Walker you see an expression of this as well. They simply punt. Now, Walker, what the facts of Walker themselves do not seem to threaten domination, right? I don't think I don't think it, I, it, it's interesting they articulate a principle in such an easy case that would be much more relevant in a in, in 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 a harder case, right? Where we might say, well, actually, we are going to treat this, hold this, um, hold treat this speech, uh, hold it to constitutional standards, but um. In the campaign finance, in the campaign finance cases, you see the conservatives saying we just completely trust the electorate to deal with whatever um, happens in the speech in in the in in the speech arena. That the nothing can impair the autonomy of the franchise. The, the the voters are robust; they are invincible. Right? They will find the truth through very through kind of a, a crude caricature of classical Millian principles. Right. Um, and I think this actually links up that, you know, sort of a practical aspect of this, I think, is um, uh, Chiara's work on, on, on lies. You know, well, how are they going to deal with lies? How are they going to, they're only being presented with a lie and they're supposed to process that. How does that not comprise domination, particularly if that lie is coming from the government? Okay. Now, um, I've discussed that, sort of discussed this at a theoretical level. At a practical level, I think the way to, to proceed here, and this is why, um, you know, uh, Trump provides, you know, sort of easy cases is you find instances where government speech seems to truly threaten to waylay the political process and result in the polity um, not being able to rule itself and also where it seems um, to confer a little benefits. This is again where I think lies are an interesting instance. Start with the easy cases, suggest they should, could potentially comprise constitutional violations. Now, obviously you're going to want to be careful with this because um, you know, the risk is you uh, begin to chew away at free speech protections, you lose, you, you potentially infringe on the principle of liberal democracy that um, sort of guides, uh, guides um, political autonomy generally. But I think there's space for using the non-domination principle to expand this idea. And um, I'll end there, happy to discuss further. Uh, thank you. And so uh, Chiara, um, uh, any response from you? Yeah. Uh, so the Supreme Court has been screwing up things related to democracy for a while now, um, whether it's Shelby County where they you know, got the Voting Rights Act or uh, Raucho where they duck partisan gerrymandering under the political questions doctrine the entire area of uh, campaign finance under the Roberts court where 
They have gutted every single campaign finance regulation that's come before them, with the exception of a narrow rule out of Florida that restricts uh, direct solicitation by judicial candidates. Uh, so I don't hold out a lot of hope that other parts of the jurisprudence in the hands of these justices will be utilized to fortify democracy. Now, I will say that one of the comforting things in watching these 60 cases after the 2020 election is that the big lie really fell apart in court. And that that is something to hold on to that because um, the court itself in Alvarez recognizes that the courts can still enforce things like perjury. That is something I, that may well save us, but perhaps because I'm, I'm writing about Black Reconstruction, my head is in a very dark place. And it just, I would just remind us all that the 15th Amendment was <laughs> from 1870. And for about 95 years, give or take, it didn't mean a damn thing. And that's what scares the hell out of me. I'll leave it there. Okay, and so Alex, uh, you have a question? Yes, uh, and Chara, you might say the Equal Protection Clause meant nothing until 1954, right? You've got that Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes quote where he says the Equal Protection Clause is a clause of last resort. Uh, and and there, are, there are others along those lines. I. I uh, so I wanted to just, I wonder if Helen put uh, a lot of my thoughts in a much better uh, way than I probably can myself, but uh, I wanted to just go back to the central thesis here, Jacob, that you have, which is does political speech dominate the lives of citizen autonomy? Uh, it, it's a great formulation and I really enjoyed your presentation. Very deep, fascinating. But I wonder the extent to which it's actionable. What is the legally cognizable harm, which is what I presented to uh, when I when I spoke to Bill and Clifford. That is to say, and if it's if the if it's a, to get standing, it's individual by individual. How can lawsuits be brought like that? I mean, you'd have an infinite. You'd have everybody could bring a lawsuit. Could make the entire class of people. And then, uh, and so, and then, and then, by the time they would, the case would get to court, one year to three years, more like like three years on appeal, th the person, whoever was the racist, whoever was the homophobe, would be saying far worse, far because that's the direction these people had. And would you have to keep relitigating, relitigating, relitigating? Right. So, th that's my question. Now, uh, I uh, probably one should not do this in polite company. But uh, I'm going to push back on Mary Rose and Erwin here. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Isn't, and I'm back here to Bill, the, the points that I had made about the 13th Amendment and the particularity of the 13th Amendment. And we're back to the badges of if slavery, the Confederate symbol, the fighting flag. What if, what if somebody wanted to put a swastika on their license plate? Okay, it's offensive. That symbol says that people are, de are degraded, dehumanized, and whatever. And uh, what I'm saying is this is a particular symbol. The government said that in a traditional form, that is to say the license plate, we don't have to have that. I mean, does, under your interpretation, Tom, uh, with its disparagement, uh, finding the disparagement for provision of the Lanham Act to be unconstitutional and in, in, cow, in a cow or whatever, however you pronounce that case, the finding the immoral and scandalous provision to be unconstitutional, can then, the, must the state open up profanity in, on license plates, insults on license plates? I mean, or, or can the government control that? Okay, so we have about three minutes to solve all of these problems. Um, so uh, Jacob, uh, uh, why don't you go first and then we'll see if uh, Owen uh, and Bill uh, wanna uh, uh, weigh in as well. So I'll just make two really quick comments, and if you want to send me an email, we can we can we can we can continue this discussion because I think you're I'm, I'm not a civil procedure expert, so I think you raised some really interesting points. Um, first of all, I think part of this is just about reconceptualizing the First Amendment, particularly pushing back against this narrative that one can just apply this caricature of million classical liberalism. Uh, I already had a brief email exchange with Professor uh, Parmet about this uh, regarding her presentation. I think part of what non-domination is is just 
introducing um, content that is not itself um, with a particular pitch or particular ideological focus that, that could, could be advanced for the court. I would say, I think the idea, I'll just go back to my last point about Janice. I do think this, the court's um, suggestion that compelled speech is problematic could be used to attack the most egregious instances of government partisan speech that seem to um, undermine rather than facilitate self-governance because we could say, well, when the government is acting, they are acting because they have authority granted by the polity, by the people. This is being um, abused to actually undermine the ability of the people to rule themselves. Um, it, it is a type of, comp of, of duly compelled speech. Janice introduces this as a, a, a reinforces how problematic principle this is over to boot could that same legal reasoning be used to attack the most egregious instances you, you work on the 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 most um egregious cases first and rely on the common law to sort of work it out i'll try in two sentences first the state of texas doesn't have to open its license plates to the message of others Texas could simply solve the problem by saying it's not going to accept any symbols. And second, if Texas wants to exclude the symbol, then they should have to meet the test of strict scrutiny as for any other designated public forum and show that there's a compelling interest. And we can argue whether it is. But if the state is going to open any designated public forum, then it's got to meet the rules for designated public forums. Um, Bill, uh, Mary Rose, uh, did you want to add anything? Oh, I agree with Erwin, and um, and uh, and so that's. I don't need to speak when Erwin Chimerinsky is here to respond. So right. thank you. And I will just defer because basically Alex was re just referencing me in relation to a previous conversation that we had. So I'll stand on what I've already said. Perfect. Um, great. Um, well, this brings us to the, the end of the hour. Um, thank you so much to our presenters, our authors for your you know, really wonderful contributions. I'm looking forward to reading the published uh, papers. Thank you also for a really engaging conversation uh, today. You know, um, I, I hope you can all come visit uh, with us at, at some point so we can see you uh, in, in person. Um, and I do want to give um, uh, Helen Norton, an opportunity to have the last word, at least the last word today, um, if she would, if she would like. So, so Helen, um, any final thoughts uh, for, from you at this point? Just uh, my heartfelt thoughts. Uh, thanks. My heartfelt thanks to, to you, Jason, and to Kat, and to Youngley, and to each and every one of these terrific speakers. I've, I've learned so much from you. This has been a terrifically fun morning, and I'm, I'm thankful for your generosity of time and insight. Take good care.